I didn't realize how dependent I was on that clock. Don't be. I know. It's consistent but inaccurate. <laughs> oh, <don't. laughs> it's right twice a day. <laughs> All right, let's get started. All right, welcome to the select board meeting. Today is August 27th, 2019. We're airing on Comcast Channel 22 and Verizon Channel 23. On tonight's agenda, we'll have liaison reports followed by the town manager report, public comment. We'll then be appointing an RMLD youth cab member. Uh, we're going to be voting to approve space for temporary lighting at Birch Meadow while Turf 2 is under repair. Uh, we'll have a brief discussion on the police chief hiring process. Then we will continue a hearing um, on Bay State Liquor for alleged violations of selling to minors. Uh, we will vote to approve an Austin Prep drainage project uh, and a monitoring agent for 475 Main Street, it's a 40R project. Uh, we will also be voting to restructure the Ad Hoc Committee for Human Rights. We'll also be reviewing a petition request for a gas leak audit. We'll then move to future agendas and minutes, and we will have an, exec an executive session with respect to litigation. With that, uh, liaison reports. I will start with you, Mark. Um, only somewhat a liaison report, but I wanted to report to the board that um, last Friday, um, the 11th Annual Metco Pool Party um, mm -hmm. took place um, to a great success. We had 80 plus people that came, many people from Boston, many people from Reading, um, several hours, many uh, school officials came, uh, principals, local people, town officials. Um, great success again. It was just a, a great opportunity for, for people to get together and kind of showcase the, that program. Wonderful. That's it. Thank you. And? Um, so uh, as a liaison to the Board of Health, I um, can provide a report. Andy may have something to add. Um, the Board of Health uh, voted actually upon one of Andy's suggestions uh, that the, uh, on a monthly basis, the health agent scan and send the health inspection reports to the members of the Board of Health, but that they not appear in the packet. That's, um, that is the result of, of uh, a proposal that came before the Board of Health to have um, some regular um, posting of, of information and collection of data re relative to health inspection reports. That's where they've landed. There was uh, quite a bit of community input in that process. Um, and then with respect to, uh, Andy may have more to add on that matter, I'm not sure. Um, with respect to the pesticide regulations, the Board of Health asks that um, each of us, to the extent we have input for them on, and I know we provided that in person at our meeting, that we um, send written feedback to Bob, who can then forward it on to them. Okay. Did they provide a timeline for when they wanted that? They have not provided a timeline. I think as soon as possible would be helpful. Why don't we self-impose a deadline for that? I'm just trying to open my calendar here. Um, would everyone be able to provide that feedback by next Friday the 6th? Yes. Is that fine? All right. Um, and Bob, could I ask you to send a reminder to us sure. uh, on the 4th? Thank you. Is that all in? Uh, that is all on the board of, from the Board of Health. I, Andy, I don't know if you wanted to chime in now with anything else you'd like to add from the Board of Health meeting. Um, they re, uh, just a couple things. They reorganized. Mm -hmm. um, Emmy Dove was elected chair. Mm -hmm. Eleanor Shen Shonkoff was elected vice chair. Um, issue about the, the board had expressed an easy access to a summarized data set from uh, health inspections. Mm -hmm. And so but they wanted to be sensitive to staff time, mm -hmm. uh, which mm -hmm. is why I suggested just having the having the reports, the raw data essentially right. scanned and given to them. Mm -hmm. um, and that's it. Yeah, no, you covered it. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Very good. Um, uh, also, another area where I am the co-liaison with Andy, and I know Andy will be speaking later this e evening to uh, where we've arrived with a, with a proposal on 
uh, restructuring the ad hoc committee, but so you have a sense of this, where we are in terms of the substance of the work on the committee. Um, we have committee members uh, working on a proposed mission and structure for a future human rights focused organization um, with the goal of um, soliciting community stakeholder input. Um, so that's that's where we are as of now. Um, later on the agenda, uh, I would be happy to, to go into greater detail on this, but uh, I just wanted to, to let folks know that uh, uh, in my capacity as the one of the public safety liaisons together with John, that about a week and a half ago we heard from Bob that the police chief position has been posted um, and John and I met with Bob last week to learn more about the process going forward j j based on uh, how the process has operated historically. John knew more about that having been through it um, in, in other um, hiring processes. Um, but I'm happy to provide a greater update um, at, when that appears on the agenda uh, with the <coughs> goal additionally of hearing from the rest of the board their thoughts on that process. Great, thank you. And John? Just to, just to echo what Ann's talking about. I mean, I, we have it on the agenda, so we'll be talking more about that. Um, but I don't have anything beyond our work together on the public safety. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Uh, Andy, did you have? You Just have a, a quick addition to Ann. Uh, mm -hmm. Did a great job covering the Board of Health and the ad hoc, which has sort of been keeping us busy lately. Mm -hmm. um, the ad hoc is also, in addition to, I don't know if you said this, but in addition to kind of coming up with a um, sort of how the the, the this entity would be uh, formed, structured. Um, another member uh, uh, is working on language for the mission of of, mm -hmm. of the um, this entity. So that together with the mission and the formation, you have um, the basis for a committee or commission or board or whatever. That's it. Um, as far as the ad hoc goes, it's. Correct me if I'm wrong. Set to sunset uh, at the end of November. It is. Um, is the committee on track to submit a recommendation by that time, or perhaps for an October agenda item? Should we consider extending that? So, as part so of tonight's agenda item, we're actually proposing an extension of the authorization through June 1st. With, but we are hoping that we can wrap up the. Um, the work of coming up with the proposal mm -hmm. by November, <coughs> hoping that then we could go forward with putting something um, together for April town meeting, which is why we would want it right. authorized through June. June. So, but we are hoping that the the main substance of the work in terms of what we what we would propose would be wrapped up by the original sunset date. Great. Okay. Thanks for the update. Um, so I do not have liaison reports. Bob, I will hand it off to you for town manager report. Thank you. A uh, couple of dates, um, some that uh, I'll ask the board to attend on August 28th, which is tomorrow, uh, at 6 o'clock at the Reading Public Library, MassDOT is having a public meeting to discuss their paving operations on Main Street from the Stoneham border to train tracks. They expect to begin sometime during the week of September 8th, including the possibility it will start on the 8th, which is a Sunday. We'll have uh, public safety and engineering staff there to help answer questions. Um, as I understand it, they are likely to do nighttime work and daytime work. Um, it is much more likely for them to do the paving during the day, but then the binder um, uh, the night before and to rip up roads, or I'm sorry, at nighttime. And uh, they'll provide a lot of communication in terms of, uh, I, I believe the objective is to always keep two lanes open, one for north, one for south. So it'll certainly impact the community and we'll stay on top of what the logistics are. Um, September. Are any detours? Uh, are no. any detours anticipated? No. Do they really think they're going to start the day that the Fall Street Fair is rolling? I mean, I, I, <laughs> with all yeah. you know, just common sense. Um, yes, indeed. You know. <laughs> I, you know, they said the eighth, but I have to imagine they really meant Monday the ninth. But mm -hmm. they said it several times. So well, maybe we can should we bring we it up with them tomorrow yeah. night. We will. Say, can we influence that start date? We'll ask. If we can mm -hmm. try. Yeah. Um, 
FinCom is meeting September 11th. That is a change from September 4th. They have canceled their 918 financial forum. Um, I would ask that at least one board member could attend the September 11th uh, FinCom meeting. Um, we will be providing some information to them as staff that would have been in a financial forum in order that the October financial forum can speed up. So we're going to give them some previews of a lot of information, and I think it would be helpful for the board uh, to have a presence there. Can you post us just to Certainly. And then us? the next night, uh, Thursday, September 12th, at 6 o'clock, the school committee is meeting in the high school library. Um, I'd also request that a board member attend approximately at 7 o'clock because both the Permanent Building Committee and our CASA will be on the agenda. Um, the PBC is going to preview a lot of the work they did um, on the school buildings, which they'll give a summary in the October Financial Forum and to November Town Meeting. So I think it would be helpful if a board member was there for that. Let's go ahead and post for that one, too. Okay. Thanks. Uh, we have two economic development meetings. Um, we're meeting with Andy and Mark in another week or so to discuss in more detail. But on September 18th at 6 o'clock at the uh, Pleasant Street Center, there's uh, reimagining Reading. Uh, much more importantly than that, there's free pizza and ice cream, though. There's, there's big, big flyers going out. There's the pizza and the ice cream. So. What time is that up at? 6 o'clock. Six. Uh, and the purpose of that is to specifically discuss the downtown area. On October 23rd, there's a broader economic development summit that's going to be held at the public library. Um, the meeting start time will be either 6 o'clock or perhaps a little later, and we'll provide a lot more information um, as that date get, gets closer. What time is that? Uh, we don't know yet on the October 23rd, John. Um, a lot of the businesses in town prefer a 6 o'clock start, not a 7.30 one, so we'll have to kind of wing that. And that's October 23rd? Correct. Those are both Wednesday nights. Bob, so we don't um, mm -hmm. well, we keep mumbling among ourselves about what time it is. Would you mind sending just a brief list of these meetings sure. and, and their dates and times? Okay. Actually, uh, I'll get to that. Yes, I, I will. Um, a number of you, I think all of you, received an email from someone that was complaining about tree damage. Mm -hmm. um, I'll summarize that um, in late 2015, this person bought a house and contacted us about taking a tree down, a public tree. The tree was healthy, so we didn't, wasn't doing any harm uh, since then we've been out twice and trimmed it and we went out again today to understand the concern and the concern was about sap dropping on a car so it wasn't branches falling but it was uh, sap falling so I, I hope the issue has been uh, solved this morning <clears throat> a couple more things <coughs> please note in your packet there's a follow-up on some ABCC alleged violations for cafe Capri and Anthony's cold fire pizza both happened last April 1st uh, the board's previously mentioned inviting liquor license holders in early in the process before their December 1st renewal applications. Um, if the board wants to do that, I'd like to um, send out invitations and get that on an agenda because we need to contact the business community quickly. Um, both your October 15th and 29th uh, meetings have plenty of room on the agenda. If the board wants to uh, have that kind of a meeting, just let us know. And it doesn't have to be this minute, but just let me know. Has that been done historically? Um, once. Once the board asked all the liquor license holders in because there'd been a series of violations and gave them a bit of a talking to. I think, John, you might have been on the board or I was, was just been before you. I can't remember. No, it was as I was early on the board, and you know, we've actually had since that time until this year. It's been good, yeah. It's been almost nothing has happened with one glaring exception, which we dealt with. So, um, why don't little, we? It's a little disturbing. We've got three of them. You know, in a very why short window of time. Okay. Why don't we table that for the end of the meeting when okay. we can talk about future agendas and see if that makes sense or not? Okay. And lastly, uh, Anna, if you don't mind passing sure. that around, um, this is a draft 2020 schedule from January through December for the board to look at. Um, I'd ask you to send me any comments or concerns over the next week or so, and then I'll put this electronically in your September 10th packet. Thanks, um, especially I'd like to draw your attention to February 18th or 25th. Um, the best meeting date would normally be the 18th. Um, there's a lot of reasons, but primarily it's election uh, focused. So there's a deadline of the 25th. Uh, because of the winter especially, I never like to meet on a deadline. I like to meet before mm -hmm. a deadline. But unfortunately, February 18th is school vacation. So I'd ask the board members to have a look at the schedule and, and give me some feedback on that. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you.
Okay. One quick comment. I apologize for missing the liaison. The Economic Development Subcommittee did, in fact, meet, um, uh, mention the upcoming yeah. meetings. But I wanted to just mention that um, we, I think, are on track to uh, be able to come back at the end of September if they're on the agenda to have a discussion about a suggested uh, structure and mission statement for, for what that would do. And as Bob pointed out, um, one of the things that is part of the discussion is that this would be uh, kind of a strategic economic development activity. In other words, the downtown is clearly a critical part of it, but other parts of town are as well. And that's perhaps a distinction from some of the very downtown-focused operational activities. And so we're, we should be prepared to come back with some more information on that. We're conducting interviews with some past members of economic development committees uh, in town. We've also looked at some other towns and what they're doing and found um, an interesting model. Uh, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, another town that's, that's doing some things uh, and making contact with them to see how it's working. And we'll be able to come back and then some kind of a recommendation on it. Great. Uh, so, Bob, as far as the February 4th, 18th, 25th, is there a reason why we don't do the 11th? I realize it puts, gives us two meetings back to back, but no that reason. seems to Could do that. address your concern and buffer us a little bit more for the, that 25th deadline. Sure, yeah. Uh, unless there are any objections? to the 11th, the 4th and 11th. All right. Let's move forward with that then, Bob. All Thank right. You. Great. So next up, public comment. Uh, is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak for public comment? Hands raised. Great. Thank you. Um, just a reminder, please raise your hand, provide your name and address. Uh, please keep comments to topics under the purview of this board, and please no derogatory or campaign-related comments. Bill? Thank you. Bill Brown, uh, 3 Matt Row. Uh, not your purview, but there are now five flags and the American flag above the honor roll at the high school. Uh, thanks to, I think, the PTO, I'm pretty sure. And that's nice. Uh, the other thing, uh, Kevin and I have been meeting together to get the flag for the flagpole for uh, five from World War II that were not on the original flag, seven from Vietnam, uh, one from Korea, and the one boy from the USS stack. We hope to have that. Uh, by November the 11th. Uh, we're meeting February, uh, September 18th with the Historical Commission to see if we can get permission on the rock. If they don't give us permission, I'll move it. Anyway, so okay. <laughs> another thing, uh, this is the 75th year of the rocket for the football season, so mm -hmm. uh, information. Okay. And, and I know the history, so it is about the night we say. Thanks, Bill. And all the water out. Next. Hands. Marilyn? No, Marilyn. Oh, okay. Um, Mary O'Neill, 125 Summer Avenue. Um, I've been thinking for some time about talking to the CPDC about trees, but it may be better for the South Board to develop a town-wide tree policy. I don't know if this is something we've talked about. That would incorporate all tree-related decision-making by town boards and departments. Nothing we can do at this point will allow us to return to our beloved New England climate as we know it. Perhaps we can slow the rate of change. We are one of the fastest warming areas of the country. Trees can be one of our best resources to help us in this endeavor. It is past time that we allow uh, clear cutting of trees to make room for new subdivisions or commercial developments. We need some standards that keep at a minimum trees of a certain caliber or diameter. Um, but we need to allocate more money this year and all subsequent years to our tree budget. When we first came to Reading in the 90s, we had a shade tree nursery that was funded annually and then we funded it biannually. And now we don't, can't really keep up with the trees that we have to take down. I mean, some are just aging out. Some aren't really strong species to begin with. And we know that many, many trees on private property have been taken down with little or no replacement. Um, we also need um, more robust standards for greenery in our residential commercial projects throughout our community. Uh, we don't have one as egregious as this, but if you notice the uh, parking lot at the, the uh, Lobster Claw over the line in North Reading, they put in this vast amount of uh, new pavement with not a single tree. And in the summer, I know I've had a hard time going from a very hard par par hot parking lot um, into the store if that heat is just radiating, um, you know, the temperature is just radiating more heat. And um, we need to see this, particularly downtown, when we've allowed the developments to come right at the sidewalk and we're not requiring uh, that much uh, greenery downtown anymore. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Marilyn. Tom? Uh, 
I guess, just a point of clarification, Tom White, one of the old South Street, and if for school committee, if somebody's speaking to something on the agenda, we ask them to hold and post the agenda. I didn't know if that's what you want to do here as well, because I know there are people who want to speak to sure. the lighting in particular. So mm -hmm. just what's your preference? Uh, you're welcome to either. It's fairly early on the agenda, so if you'd like to wait uh, until that point, you're welcome to do so, or you can do so now if you'd like to, if you don't want to stay for the rest of the meeting. You're welcome to wait. I'll, I'll open up it up to public comment later as well, if that's your question. All right. Thank you. Of course. Martha Moore, uh, 102 Sanborn Lane. And um, I'm thinking about the gas leak um, audit that's on the agenda later in the evening. And I would like to support that. I think knowledge is power. And as I was driving over all the plates and patches on Main Street coming south to uh, get to this meeting, I was thinking the sooner we know where the gas leaks are, the less likely we are to pave the roads and have beautiful smooth pavement and then have to tear them up to fix gas leaks. So um, it would be good to find out as much information as we can see. Thank, Thank you. you. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, so next up, we will be appointing a new RMLD CAB member. We have a recommendation from the VASC. I believe that was Andy and Mark in this instance. Is that correct? Yes, yes. that is so correct. So you take it away. Um, Mark, we hadn't figured out who would handle this one. Um, but we, we interviewed uh, a person <coughs> to be on the um, RMLD um, uh, citizen Community citizen citizen cap, advisory the cap, board. Citizens Advisory Board. This individual had um, already been a member of the CAD. I believe he lived in Linfield, and he has um, served for uh, quite, a, quite a long time on that as a member of the CAD from that community. He's now moved to Reading, um, and he would like to serve on our behalf on our behalf, and um, I was quite impressed with him. I think uh, Mark felt the same way, so we're putting forward his name um, to uh, to recommend to the board. Were there any other applicants for that position? There were not. No. Okay. I would just add he is um, exceptionally well qualified for the position. Um, is an investor in in the space. Knows what's going on quite well. Um, is involved with the communities, is involved with the RMLD uh, as an active member. Mm -hmm. I think he'd be a, a great asset to reappoint. Yeah. I've had the privilege of, of hearing him speak at meetings when he was um, a representative from Linfield, and I think he'll be more fortunate to have him here. Right? Yeah. Um, unless there's any further discussion, the motion? What's his name? Vivek Sani. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. That's part of the motion. Vivek Sani. S-O-N-I. What is it? Vivek, V-I-V-E-K, Sani, S-O-N-I. Great. So, Mark, you can read the motion. Move that the board appoint Vivek Sani to a full position on the RMLD Citizens Advisory Board for a term ending June 30th, 2020. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Motion carries. Um, so next up, we will be voting to approve um, temporary space for temporary lighting at Birch Meadow. While Turf 2 is under repair, we have Jenna, our um, recreation director here. So come on up. Oh, I just got a race. Oh, <laughs> coordinator, <laughs> proper title. No, you just got a title. Coordinator, <laughs> all right. Welcome, Jenna. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, I don't really have anything formal prepared for this evening. It's pretty straightforward what we're asking for. Um, as you all may know, Turf 2 is being renovated at the high school, so it'll be offline <coughs> for the majority of the fall. Uh, we have a really popular program. I'm not sure if you've heard of it. It's called Saturday Night, Saturday Night Lights. Um, we have 738 kids enrolled in the program currently and we usually get about 750 to 800 every single year. So it's very, very popular. Um, the atmosphere down there is insane. People love it. Um, children and parents alike. I know that a couple people in the crowd are coaches. Even our program coordinator, Shannon, will be coaching a girls team this year. 
So um, with turf two being offline, there'll be four fields that we utilize on turf two that we will no longer have to run this program at capacity. So um, I went to the rec committee in July and I asked um, what they thought about lighting the Imagination Station lot next to Birch Meadow to allow for those four fields to still be used for the program so we could run it. Um, so they agreed that lighting that area would be great and they recommended that uh, we do it and that we bring it to the select board for your approval. Um, and also in that meeting it was discussed and I had brought up and they agreed that when those lights aren't being utilized for Saturday night lights, that the other organizations, um, specifically Reading United Soccer, Pop Warner, um, maybe Reading Youth Field Hockey, um, can utilize that space so the lights aren't sitting idle for the whole week because they have also been impacted with Turf 2 being offline. Um, they use Turf 2 whenever they can um, to get some extra space under the lights. So we're just asking that that space be lit so we could run Saturday Night Lights at full capacity and also um, have some additional space for our youth organizations to utilize during the week that they'll also be losing. Okay. Um, so a few questions before sure. we move on. Um, what is the anticipated cost? Um, the lights at the portable the portable lights at Birch Meadow will be forty two hundred dollars is the quote that okay. I received. Um, and then where will that funding be coming from? The revolving fund. So the town is covering that. Correct. Great. Uh, and so what is the ask of the board tonight? Um, specifically that you allow us to light that area mm -hmm. with the three portable lights. Okay. Great. Bob. And I'm the one that butted in and added the Parker Middle School field. Um, after discussing this with uh, Gail Dowd, the school CFO, um, the schools really see no need for it. Um, Jenna sees no need for it if the weather behaves and things go normally, and, and I would agree with all that. Um, but if something happens and suddenly that space is unusable, whether it's rain or something else, I, I don't think the sports organizations would benefit from waiting for your next meeting. So it just seems like uh, allowing it in an emergency, which is a whole other issue, um, it would be a lot more expensive. There's a lot more lights than uh, the notification of the butters. Um, but we've discussed how to do that in the event of basically an emergency. Um, thank you. I, I mean, this seems pretty straightforward to me. The town has, the community has already agreed to invest in turf two. This seems like a fairly straightforward housekeeping matter of us being asked to grant permission for the use of these spaces to be lit, as it, that falls under our purview. Um, so, I, I, unless anybody, oh, do you have a question? Go ahead. Um, Jenna, who will be responsible for managing the lights, turning them on, turning them off, things like that? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, so, I have reached out to all of the organizations. Um, I would be more than willing to turn on the lights before I left, as would Shannon. Um, and I have asked the organizations to designate two specific people from each organization only to turn the lights off and on. And then when the lights get delivered, I will show them how to shut them off and on. I will even send a video to them in case they forget. Um, and the DPW will also be refueling them for us as well. Okay. So okay. I'll, I'll be overseeing that specific area and the organizations will be helping as well. Great, so each night the one person will end up with responsibility to make sure it's off. Yep, there's two designated people, so whoever is on for that night from that particular organization. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so unless, I, I know there's public comment on this, so before I open it up to that, um, is there anyone the one on the board who has questions or concerns? This seems pretty straightforward that we want to support this and agree to having these fields lit. Agree. I agree that a good question because it is. Yeah. <laughs> once in a while. And this has been um, accepted by the Recreation Committee. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Public comment? Sure. Please remember to uh, state your name and address. Wayne Lota, 25 Ashley Place, in Reading. Obviously, right on the street. Right. Um, I, uh, thanks, Jenna, for uh, letting us know about the lights. That's great. We're, we're excited about that. Um, I know this is common. Can I ask a question about the lights? Absolutely. Yeah, in the case of the 100 year flood and if we had to move or the lights had to be moved, how would that? 
go about what would the cost of that be because it's a rental so to move lights from one field to the other I know and, and I, I kind of work in that space so movement of lights is expensive so say you have a week in the middle of the season a week at the end of the season that they'd have to be moved from field to field how would that work what would it cost how quickly could the timing be on something like that has anyone looked into that Bob. Um, if we do have to uh, relocate to Parker, um, I believe it's 10 lights instead of four. Is that about right? Yep. Uh, and the cost would be more than $10,000 if it were the full season. Um, my understanding is DPW would move them. Um, but, but again, that is that is the 100-year flood. That is something that we don't anticipate. Um, and should it happen, we're going to have to gather and have a discussion. Uh, but staff would move it and we'll have to go out and procure uh, I'm not even sure if those four lights can be used I don't think they were tall enough yeah I think that there would have to be taller lights and instead of moving them I think the solution would be Just getting get additional ones, yeah. right and would that be paid for out of the revolving fund Same, yeah and if that were to happen would the board need to vote on anything or you no. can move without us no that this would cover that, that would emergency cover it? Yeah. perfect okay all right, so to my comment, um, thank you. Um, to my comment, um, and it, it has more to do with um, the lack of field space, and uh, particularly Ruskin, obviously uh, Saturday Night Lights has a, a great enrollment. We're not much under that, about 652 kids um, that need approximately 742 hours of practice time, and we're, we have about 475 now. Um, and it's less of an issue about the fields themselves but more in this time of the year and how much time can be utilized with the late school start um i know that uh, for whatever reason and I, I haven't got to talk to you gender about it but i know you've talked to mike that the ad has requested to have field permits um for, for the high school longer so we're talking about seven o'clock start times for rust on a majority of fields that aren't lit so we have permits and we have great fields and we have the ability to use them but starting at seven o'clock or even six o'clock as we get into the fall, you know, with sunset, you know, at the fourth week of September, uh, last light is 6.55. So even if we got permits for six, we have an hour on each field. And it's just, it's just not enough time. Um, it's just, it's, it's so to the point of Parker, um, you see that as a great opportunity to open up a ton of time to have practice for all teams. Um, I know a butters may be an issue we're talking and again i'm not discounting one person it makes a difference too but um, i think we have someone here tonight that isn't a butter that actually is the guy right on the corner of temple and, and and the school itself as well as there's five total homes and one's unoccupied right now so we're talking about three additional people to notify my issue is i know protocol and you have to go through and and, and, and make that happen but if, if it, we can't get more field space it won't happen this year at all it's impossible to make it happen and you're talking about impacting 652 kids and you know i've been doing this a long time it's a 100 i spent 15 hours a week all year round volunteering for all different sports in town and it's a big deal for kids to be out there and have you know have, have their time in the field and to their parents it's a big deal you know it's we're providing a, a service but it's our product uh, mm -hmm. and it's it's important you know so thank you I'll other public comment well, uh, of nurse 24 Smith Ave um, Mother Rusk uh, board yeah. also oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> not even building thank God <laughs> uh, Jacko, you know Wayne's comments yeah, I think part of this too is the turf too being down displacing a lot of folks this specific fall season um, so Parker as an option or as needed is it's great, thank you. Um, we talked as a club where we would foot the bill even for the lights down at Parker. Pay for ourselves, share with other organizations. We're one group, we would reach out to the other groups who could use the space also, share the cost amongst us. Uh, again, I think that the problem is the success of recreation is how. People want to be part of it, adults, kids, being down one field in the peak season like fall is a real, real hand behind the back. Uh, so with our helping to fund the lights down there as needed, whatever that defined as, for this one specific season um, would be a huge help to us. And for Jenna, it would be you know, less people barking at her from all ends. <laughs> um, so thank you. To your point, personally, it, to me, this seems like something the town should foot in its own. 
expense, and that's the approach that's been taken. So, okay. John, I, I just have a question: Have has the recreation? Have you guys been to recreation and made this request? Because I think the programs come through recreation. Correct. Okay. So is this news tonight? or has recreation considered going to the school committee because the school committee controls park you know the selectmen do not actually you do how is that possible we don't get we don't the vagaries of reading oh my god all right so so good you're in the right place then <laughs> which is most unusual yeah uh, because everywhere else that's not the case every other school um so has the idea of a second set of lights come up with recreation I'll hit you. Tom yeah Tom Weiss with you on South Street um, and Jenna and you know, we can speak to this a little bit there was a meeting a few weeks ago um, probably back in early July I think give or take about the fall schedule and what was going to happen and whatnot at that time there was a question about whether or not there was still funding um, for Parker uh, and there was some follow-up along, along those lines. You all may remember, and as far as I can follow it up with, I talk, try to get Chuck and be able to figure it out today as well. There was money allocated in the school committee budget in, in January exactly for this reason. And it was $20,000, give or take, at that point in time. So somewhere between the schools and the town, somewhere there's money somewhere allocated for it and this was discussed as a problem of communication at that point in time mm -hmm. that we were trying to resolve because uh, this is a foreseen absolute fact um, before we go there john and one other thing i want to add as well and in addition to that in addition to what a few other people said people aren't giving enough account for how torn up birch meadow is going to be throughout this time and how completely unusable it will be in the middle of october you have about three or four more weeks of season after that point in time if you have teams on there, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, there's no rest time for that, none whatsoever. Parker as a turf field can handle that. Birch Meadow as a grass field cannot. And Saturday Night Lights tears up the field big time. So I really think we should figure out from a select board perspective, rec committee perspective, I'm obviously here wearing two hats because I also am wearing United, um, figure out how we can make sure Parker is illuminated throughout the season, not just on an ad hoc temporary basis. So Tom, to your point, I, I would recommend many of those recommendations come through the Recreation Committee. There are first approach, we have the chair here tonight. Um, so I would recommend if there are concerns or suggestions or preferences on how that's to move forward, um, I would recommend attending one of the meetings and discussing it directly with them um, before it elevates to us, because I'd be very interested in, to hear their perspective on it as well. And Mr. Can we put that onto our next meeting's agenda? I just have a placeholder in case there is an item that comes forward to us. Um, we can. I want to defer to recreation first. I'd want it to have to come directly from them. Agreed. I just don't want it to wait a month or longer. Oh, given the time. Forward. Yeah. On the yeah. Uh, that's fair. That's We've had a placeholder. placeholder. Yeah, oh. absolutely. Good point. Thank you. Well, I haven't scheduled it yet. John, I'll the reason I was and then Tom. The reason I was asking that question is because protocol is that we've waited to hear from recreation and it doesn't sound like recreation has heard this other than in passing that's why I ask if any of you had brought it to an agenda item at recreation mm -hmm. and to, to Mark's point I get where you're right where you're at I mean, timing is everything this thing's rolling now or very shortly I mean the fall season's coming um, and if it hasn't it has not been in front of recreation is that correct they haven't specifically discussed Parker. They've only discussed the lights at Birch Meadow. But we could certainly address so, it at our next so meeting. So the big question is, when is the next recreation so I'm gonna, meeting, right? So I'm going to put a pause on this. Um, we have representatives, it seems, from the various committee Same or the night. various groups who meeting. represent sports and athletics here. Um, I would highly encourage you to reach out to recreation, get on their agenda sooner rather than later, hopefully. We will put a um, placeholder on our agenda for our next meeting um, in the event that recreation can meet before that and make a re recommendation for us for the board's consideration um, with that said are there more comments specifically to the lighting on the agenda item? yes Todd Petron, 37 Temple Street I have bought the field and I have a pair of soccer player 
and the urgency to this cannot be understated. If we wait too long, you know, we're going to lose out on time, practice time, you know. And we can't, I don't, actually I don't know why Parker doesn't already have permanent lights, but that part aside, the traffic's not an issue, the lights aren't an issue, the time is an issue. In the spring, they're on the fields till 7.30, 8 o'clock at night, whether it's just kids, you know, shooting the ball around or not, so it's not a problem with the timing. There are five houses that about it. One is unoccupied right now, pending sale. Um, the other, I'm one of the other ones. And on the opposite side for me, the other house doesn't, two of the houses don't even, only one lines up directly with the field. The other one's up the hill as you come down the road. So um, if the committee could make some motion to speed things up for the rec committee ahead of time, that would be something that would take out a procedural issue, I guess. So, um, but the season starts now. So, um, and we need the time now for all the players. I mean, there's so many teams, there's so many kids involved. I've also been a coach, uh, assistant coach, and you definitely need the playing time to get the kids out of summer mode back into, uh, back into shape for uh, soccer. Thank you, Todd. Yep. Goodness. Um, I hear all of what you're saying, and and I, as a former coach, Russ coach, you know, we played on the upper level of Parker where there were roots growing and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. you guys do do a great great job of um, utilizing as much space as possible. Um, and while I would like to um, hear, I would like to consider um, the the use of Parker, we, we I think, um, at least I feel, that it's important to respect the uh, input from the Recreation Committee as they are sort of the professionals that advise us if you, in the manner of speaking. So um, whenever they can meet and discuss it and bring it forward, um, we'll go, you know, we'll hear their recommendation and, and go from there. At least that's the way I... Thanks, Andy. Any other public comment on the subject? Great. Um, Mark, if you can read the motion to approve the usage I, of the... I have oh. another question, if that's okay. all right. Um, so, Jenna, have you, have you adjusted the user fees to reflect the costs of the lights here and then potentially the lights that will might go at Park Parker? Or have those been adjusted to reflect the added cost? Because that's how fees are, you come to the terms of fees mm -hmm. based on cost. And the cost is different. Yeah, and, I, I mean, I it's not. substantially different. Yeah. So that's something to consider. And I know that um, Pete mentioned, you know, the willingness to step forward and write a big check, but I think, if you spread it out, I mean, through the, you know, through the user fee uh, for the fields. I mean, that's, you know, yeah. using fields in many other towns, I know that that's the way that whatever it costs is what they charge. Yeah, and I, I didn't think of that. That is a good point. I didn't think about that just from the standpoint that I was looking at it, that it's kind of an extenuating <coughs> circumstance. So turf two is offline in the late school starting. So I don't really know what it will actually look like in the future because turf two is kind of like just throwing a wrench into everything so i thought it was fair to keep the fees the same because they will be sacrificing the lights at turf two and wouldn't be playing on a commensurate surface if they're at the birch meadow grass i'm or, just trying to keep the money but, straight i'm not yeah. trying to yeah i'm not trying to push out fees i'm just right, right. trying to keep it you know, in the boxes that they're supposed to be in. Yeah. That's all. I no. mean, I think it's yeah. just good good policy for us to do that. I mean, so. from what we've heard, though, one, I mean, it's it's forty two hundred dollars, right? I mean, this is not a tremendous um, amount. Yeah. Of Potentially money. ten thousand more. Yeah. That's a set. That'll be that would be a separate discussion. But as far as the forty two hundred goes, I mean, that seems like something that a was anticipated and b was budgeted. So it seems inappropriate well, to redistribute that from a fee perspective to the user. I don't know how we can come to the conclusion that it was budgeted because what we did is we, the capital project was was accounted for. 
Now, I don't know that we were, you know, accounting for additional expenses separate from the capital project. So we John, allocated that. I'm going to tell you, what, I'm a flag. Both of us we both got off yep. topic. Yep. Uh, well, we're on, right so, exactly on topic. Uh, well, for the purposes of tonight, we have been asked to vote to approve the use of the space. But I agree. If we want to have a longer conversation about it, I think we can. But we have to move on with the agenda. Um, Mark, if you'd be so kind. Move to approve temporarily lighting the area near the Birch Meadow unlit softball field for athletics and recreation programs. To allow Reading organizations to use these lights and field space and to approve temporary lights at the Parker Middle School turf field and use of that space as may be needed by these Reading organizations due to weather or other unforeseen events as determined by the Recreation Administrator. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Great. Motion carries. Thank you all very much for coming. Thanks. Could I just one quick comment? Go ahead. Um, might be helpful. I know that the um, school department did, in fact, allocate some money for uh, understanding that there would be some issues going on. It'd be great to understand what that was, what was done, because it definitely was in the budget. Bob? Um, it was for two purposes. I, it was either 15 or 20 grand, Tom. I, I really don't remember, but you're right. Um, one of them was busing, though, just to keep mm -hmm. that in mind. Right. It was because right. there would be less home games. You'd have to bus to more away games. So that, right. I don't know what that's cost, but that's definitely a factor. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm sure there's not this big pool there, but I just wondered. Let's just get it accounted yep. for. Let's just figure out what's the limit. Yep. Okay. Great. Thank you all. Thanks. All right. Next up on the agenda, um, we will be having an update on the police chief hiring process. So, Bob, am I handing this over to you, or Anne, are you speaking on it as liaison? Um, I was planning to speak to it as liaison, but I think questions should go probably to all of us. I haven't been through this process before John has, and Bob certainly understands it from um, from front to back in a way that uh, I don't have I don't have the background. Um, so the job for police chief has been posted. I understand. Can you speak up a little bit, Anne? Yes. The, jo the, the police chief position has been posted to solicit applicants. I understand applicants have been received both internally and externally. Um, the town has hired a consulting agency to oversee the process. The, cons the consultant has an array of services that they can provide. Um, and the town is currently um, planning to have the the agency oversee um, an assessment center. So out of the applicant pool, a certain number will be selected to go through um, the assessment center, which um, which the which a group of um, a group of town staff um, and I think Bob. Um, I think, would you like to go over who you've thought of for the selection sure. committee? Um, would, so this, the selection committee would not run the, the assessment center. This consultant would run the assessment center with the selection committee to observe. Yeah, a selection committee, uh, which I'll describe shortly, would have an upfront job to decide how many candidates to send to the assessment center, typically three to seven and then a back-end job, and then sit through and watch only as observers, the assessment center. We sit back there, we're not allowed to say a word. Um, watch it, um, the firm that runs it is uh, generally retired police chiefs or sometimes active police chiefs, not in this geography. Um, they take a little bit of time and write up a pretty thorough evaluation of what they saw and make, don't make a recommendation, just to score all the candidates in many, many areas. And that's something that we as a, a selection committee have a lot of input to up front. What are the things that are in, you know, interesting to your community or important to your community? And then depending on the day of the assessment center and the performance of the candidates, um, the task of the selection committee could be quite simple or quite complex, depending on what happened. Um, in the past, I've been part of both of those uh, scenarios. So I had selected uh, Ann and John from the select board, Chuck Robinson from the school committee, uh, Fire Chief Greg Burns, Library Director Eamon Lamon, HR Director Judy Perkins as the six that would join me in this process. Um, so I understand that the consulting agency pro can provide an array of services, but it depends on what the budget is. And 
something like coming up with a community profile um, would would require that that could be disseminated to applicants. Um, perhaps a glossy brochure would would be above current budget. Um, something like interviewing all members of the select board to get to solicit their input would be within budget, um, although not currently contracted. Um, John and I talked about wanting to have a uh, community and public input process, um, which could we, which could include the two of us, which could include the board as a whole. Um, Bob has pointed out that we don't have any office hours scheduled for the select board that could be part of or that could potentially be part of an opportunity to solicit public input. Um, so that's, I think that's, uh, we thought we would want, would want to hear from the board, thoughts on the process. Uh, I understand that the first part of the process this, um, is, is TBD in terms of who would be, how folks would be chosen from the applicant pool to continue to the assessment center. Um, I don't know how that's, how has that operated in the past? Um, well, again, and I, I can't speak for the current process, but in the past, generally speaking for a police chief, you have very few applicants. Um, okay. You know, I, I'd be guessing as to why, but I will say that um, I do not expect to see area chiefs apply for the job as a courtesy uh, to Reading. Uh, they just don't. I expect to see uh, chiefs from further away, probably smaller organizations, um, certainly uh, ranked officers, lieutenants, sergeants from any agency, including Reading. Um, and, and much like the assessment center helps determine how hard the rest of your job is, the applicant pool determines how hard that first part is. I've not looked at the applicant pool. Um, but again, traditionally the numbers are not high. Um, there's, I was aware of one community, it, it turned out to be a large city, that spent a lot of upfront time advertising, community profile, and so forth, and did get a lot of applicants and had about 70% of them not qualified. So, you know, I can't say what will happen, but I can just say based on experience, um, you pretty much have a closed pool of qualified people. If someone uh, wants to apply for the job from outside of Massachusetts and they've never been in Massachusetts, that is a very large uphill climb because uh, and mass general laws are very different than the rest of the world. Um, a person who has worked under mass general laws for their career would just have a leg up. Doesn't mean someone can't learn, um, but from past experience, you know, we've, we've seen good candidates from New Hampshire, Maine, uh, one from Connecticut that had previously worked in Massachusetts, but none from outside that, uh, you know, would really be able to walk in. Um, this is one of the most important jobs in the community, certainly. Um, it deserves a lot of scrutiny. Um, and, and it is a very, if you will, a very professional position. It's not something you take a flyer on someone. I think they can grow into the job. This person would be fine. It really has to be a, a hire that everyone feels very good about. And it's, it historically has the um, that initial screening been done by a selection committee mm -hmm. or by not by the consultant but by the selection um, committee? The, the consultant, if asked, and we have asked in the past, will give you insight into some of the candidates. Now, would they give the insight to me or to the selection committee? It's not clear. They they give me the choice. Um, Retired police chiefs and current police chiefs know a lot about candidates for these jobs that you don't necessarily want to describe in public, for instance. I know why this person's applying because there's this problem where they are. Um, so that process plus the fire chief's very helpful in also getting information. You know, we like to kind of avoid the problems right up front um, to the extent we have good legal advice on them. Um, I'm open to doing it either way. I don't have a problem with the selection committee seeing all that. That's the way we've done it in the past, but other communities don't always do it that way. One other thing that was, had not been clear to me previously, but Bob is charged with hiring the police chief. The select board as a whole is charged with ratifying or not the selection. Mm -hmm. uh, Vanessa, along to um, just take off from, from what Ann stated, does it make sense for this board to have 
a more upfront role in how the individuals will be assessed so that um, candidates are selected somewhat based on uh, the feelings of the board so the board is more likely to ratify a candidate that comes forward. Um, so there's that that comment. What, what kind of input do we want the board to have up front in the hiring process? And then the second question is I think this is something that we're, I think in hiring a police chief, I'd really like to stress what I think in John recommended is to have community input um, on the, on on what the community is look what this community is looking for uh, in their police chief, and I, I would think that would be uh, a big influ that would that would influence me greatly if I could understand what the community is looking for in a police chief. Um, when it comes time to ratify. Further to that point, um, Bob, you mentioned some candidates for the selection committee, but you didn't mention any citizens on that. Committee. Correct. Is there a reason why? I don't want the group too large, certainly. I don't know how I would find a resident that would be in some fashion qualified to hire a police chief compared to another resident. I, I don't know how to do that. I would actually imagine you could find a couple of people that would have a lot of interest in, in participating that way. I, I'm, it just strikes me that as we we need this community input as much of it up front as we possibly can, but the selection committee is, is where things really are decided in terms of who's going to move on. And it would strike me that to have one or two citizens added to that group, and you'd be at about eight people at that point, if I got it right. Um, but that, I think, would be a very helpful part of the process. So to answer kind of both uh, Andy and Mark's questions is sort of two issues. Um, one is how the board gets involved, and one is how residents or the community gets involved. Um, I had imagined how the community gets involved was through you, all five, and then you five funnel to whoever's in the selection committee. Um, still under discussion, um, you know, technically, we've not signed a contract and established a scope of work with this firm other than the assessment center is definitely a given. That's just, that's just necessary. Um, but as Ann mentioned, and I, I expected to do it this time, um, they expect to talk to each of you individually. Now, the question is, um, when do you want that to happen? Um, and how do you engage the public, perhaps before that, so that you can then reflect that? Um, you know, the idea of one or two residents is okay, but I, again, I don't know how you're going to find residents that are going to reflect the whole community the way you five are, respectfully. That's what your job is. Um, you know, I could pick or you could pick one or two residents and we'll get complaints. Why wasn't this one picked? Why wasn't that one picked? You know, whatever. I have a, to that point, the seven people you've mentioned, aren't they all citizens of this town? Uh, I better check. <laughs> uh, yes. Yes, they are. Uh, no, Judy's not. Sorry. Okay, Judy. Six out of seven. So six of the seven are citizens of Reading, and at least two of those, in this case, have been elected by the citizens of this town to represent them. And what we're talking about is opening a, a dialogue with anybody that wants to talk to specifically, in this case, to the two of us. That was a plan that we had, but could speak to each of us individually and that could be brought back in a in a discussion format um, so I, I mean you know the idea of being able to manage the selection committee I think is really important and I don't think that anybody's going to find an issue with it being represented by the Board of Selectmen you know by fire by users the library for example human resources and the town manager i mean that seems to be a very logical approach the school committee chair as well yeah and we, and so yeah one thing to mention here is that so i think it was two two or three years ago now when we were searching for a library director um, i was asked to be a resident representative on that selection committee that narrowed down 
pool. It was actually a wonderful experience. Um, there were library trustees, there were library staff, um, and there was another resident in addition to myself. And I think that having residents who are not elected officials lends a different perspective. You know, we are sort of in, enmeshed in everything that happens and that, that is our job. That's why we were elected and I think that having a resident perspective from people that are not sitting where we sit um, gives a different view of people that are not as involved in the day to day and I think it adds value. It also lends itself to transparency which is one of the things that we've struggled with um, on other topics not this one in particular obviously um, so I I would be inclined to have one or two and we could open it up to have something similar to what we do we would, could post it um, the way we do any other volunteer positions who would do the interviewing of the citizens the VASC it's a, oh, if it's a volunteer, we can do it at the VASC. Yeah. Just, just to caution the board, this is my choice, not your choice, and we have to be legally very careful how this proceeds. It is not you selecting the people for the selection committee. You can certainly suggest them to me, uh, but legally you have to be careful what you do. Because the, the thing we all want to avoid, I think desperately, is turning this selection committee into a body that somehow is under open meeting law. Well, I think that's very easily avoided simply by having less than a quorum of us be represented on that. If you have a two-person subcommittee, those are subject to open meeting law. So again, how you get there is very tricky. Agreed, agreed. So but I also under, think, I'm sorry. I, I also think this is something that we, respectfully, Bob, while it's mm -hmm. absolutely at your purview, um, I also hope that it's something that can be viewed collaboratively between this board, the school committee, the library, and the residents. Mm -hmm. um, and in doing that, it makes it a more holistic approach to how we determine who's on the selection committee and the outcomes that come from it. I'm, I'm just cautioning the board that we really have to be careful on the process that you use to get there. I'm not doubting the objectives yeah. or the objectives. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, you know, speaking of, of uh, about open meeting law with this, it doesn't isn't it all the way that it's been proposed? Subject, subject to open meeting law because no. two select board members are working on it? No, because the town manager has selected them. The board has not voted them on. So, all right. So there, there's two different parts. I, I saw a mm -hmm. question in the audience. Tom? Tom Wise, one of you wants to ask for just a point of information. A point of clarification. Point of are you speaking as a school committee member or as a resident? Speaking as a school committee member, thank, thank you. you. Um, speaking on that behalf, just as a note that when the school, when the when Dr. Doherty has been hiring people like the most recent um, director of student, uh, student services, that process did include community members, in particular parents from the schools. Um, it included, you know, members of the admin staff, teachers, principals, and a couple of uh, members from the, from the parent community. So just as an FYI, from a parallel perspective, that helps at all. Thank you, Tom. Um, so, Bill? I challenge Bob's job and let him do it. Thank you, Bill. Uh, so just actually, um, to, yes. did, did, did Dr. Doherty select the community members for that process? Did the school committee select the community members for that process? How did, do you remember? Dr. How that Doherty worked? selects them. He okay. sends out an email um, okay. as a, you know, here's the process. He, mm -hmm. If what happens is he goes through and he says, we're hiring somebody, mm -hmm. here's the process I'm going to undertake. And we say, okay, that looks great. And then he goes through and selects the people to be part of that. Okay. Um, and then he reports back on who those are, and mm -hmm. and then he's actually to that point as well. He's the hiring agent, mm -hmm. and we are in many cases the ratifying body as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. um, almost very very similar uh, process wise. Thank you, Tom. Um, so look, there's there seems like like there's two questions that have arisen. Um, the first is um, who from the board represents us um, at Bob's choosing, supposedly, uh, on this selection committee. Um, and the second is who comprises the selection committee more broadly, um, including the potential for residents. So with those two questions on the table, I'd be curious for the board's thoughts. Bob. Well, I think the other question, and maybe you blended in the last part is how do you get public input? Because just right. two residents aren't going to do that. 
Agreed. I think that's yes. I think that's Two a residents. separate and broader question. Two, Two new residents. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I think that um, I, you know, I respect the legalities of the issue, and that it's the town manager's, manager's job um, for the charter, um, and then the select board is a ratifying body. But as previously stated by Vanessa, I would hope that it would be from the get-go, Bob, a collaborative experience. Obviously, we can't order you to um, put t two resident residents on um, the selection committee, but um, uh, I, I, I would you be willing to um, consider what we might recommend or? Of course. Yeah. But, but again, but the, we would not be able to inv I, interview I them by the, the VASC, for well, example. Well, I think the challenge is how does any of us pick two residents that are representative of 27,000 people for this? I just, I just don't know how. I mean, I think you may overestimate the number of people who would volunteer for this. Um, well, they have to volunteer. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well. So I mean, you that know, could be, but following what? Well, I mean, there's a couple different ways we could go about this. Um, one, if you're watching at home and would be interested, <laughs> you can reach out to us, the board, or, or to the town manager directly if you're interested in becoming the citizen representative. Um, and two, if there is someone that we as board members think could be an appropriate person to represent the community as a resident, we could go, that's how I was asked to be part of the library selection committee, library director. Um, it could be posted on the website. Um, we don't have a parent email list the way the superintendent does to reach out to, but we have other means. Taxpayers. <laughs> um, so I think that that's spot on in terms of the approaches kind of open it up, ask people if they would like to participate. I think that's great. Um, I do think that there is a, an important role in the public input to us mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. thinking through how we can do something that in, entices people to come and, and we'll be there to listen uh, beyond office hours because I don't think that's proven to be a, an effective way to get a lot of people to come right. so far. So I think we need something broader than that. And, but I think that this is a very worthy topic of that. And maybe it's actually having a couple of uh, listening sessions, literally, um, and sponsoring them, giving people lots of notice, talking about it through the community, and, and getting it out there. Yeah. Which actually brings up a really good point that we haven't talked about, Bob. What is the timeline for this process? Um, Are we talking three months, six months, a as year? As soon as possible is the fairest answer. I mean, the department has been operating under difficult circumstances for far too long. Um, and this process just needs to move along, but not at a speed that won't yield a good result. Mm -hmm. So we have to get the good result first. So, all right, so let's take these one at a time. Um, we've already identified a few methods to reach out to the community to have someone volunteer. be volunteer. Yeah. Um, as far as who from our board is a member of that selection committee. I know it defaulted to Ann and John as liaisons to public safety, um, but I'd be curious if the board has other thoughts on whether that is the most logical approach, um, if we are comfortable with that, if not. Can I speak to the first point and, and then about, about the um, having community members on the committee? I would look to, as far as people who are qualified to give input into uh, what type of uh, police chief we're looking for, there are a number of people that I know that have been long-standing members of town government, uh, volunteers, who know the town very well, they're very connected to the town, some have been select board members previously, some have been on town meeting forever. Um, and I would, um, I think I would try to make sure that one of those uh, individuals were, were, were included for the knowledge of the town. As far as um, your second question goes, uh, um, I'll let somebody else weigh in on that, I guess. Okay. Yeah, I, all right, I lied. <laughs> I'll, I'll wait. 
I, I think that uh, if the chair has time, the chair should be involved in this. We voted for you um, as chair to do certain things. And yes, it's not this particular thing, but I think that uh, that would be an appropriate, uh, one of the appropriate picks to be considered. Thanks. I think that's, that's um, well stated in terms of the possibility of participating. But other than that, I think it may be that, that all of us would, would want to be involved, and I don't think that's practical. I think we should narrow it down to a couple mm -hmm. people. Huh? Just to add in a wrinkle, um, I'll try to think about the flexibility here, but this has been a daytime activity previously for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and that does limit some people, whether it's your participation or the public. Um, some of it is absolutely has to be daytime. There's no, there's no alternative, but maybe some of it could be night meetings. Mm -hmm. huh? Ann, John, I don't know if you have thoughts on this. Well, I... Um, was excited about becoming part of the process. I want a I want a good result at the end of the day that, and I want a process that all members of the board feel comfortable with. Um, I I think some of my background um, related to criminal justice and the law could be useful in looking at at this. But I also my my higher priority is. Um, a good process and a good result that the board as a whole is comfortable with. So that's like that's where I am, I guess. <laughs> John, your thoughts? Oh, yeah, I have some thoughts. Um, first of all, I, it seems like um, on the first item, I, I really don't think it serves the process to try to find a random, you know, um, person to join Bob Selection Committee. That's just a personal opinion just from the standpoint of having been involved at various times in various venues in committee selection what I have found is that <clears throat> if you have people who have um, closer working relationships and knowledge of both the position and the expected outcome results turn out more efficient and you get a better result that has been my personal experience because I've been involved in committee selection both in this town and professionally um, for and so from that standpoint I think that <clears throat> we're gonna put a we're gonna put a citizen or two in a very difficult position we could ask that person we could solicit um, people who we think would be good at it and I think that honestly you're gonna put them in a really tough spot I think it I think it makes it that much more difficult they don't have the luxury of either being hired to work specifically inside the municipality or having been elected to represent the citizens and so with that in mind I think it's it's not a unwillingness to have somebody included it's I think it puts the person or persons in a difficult position during the process and I think it extends the process because there are things that you need to do to help catch them up I'm fine with however the board makes a suggestion I'm just airing you know what my opinion is on this Bob ultimately has to decide how he's going to do it because it's his process and it's his hire um, and I'm respectful of everybody else's opinion, I'm just sharing mine, that I think that it puts undue stress on whoever you select, and it puts stress on the situation itself towards what we're all looking for, which is the best possible outcome. Relative to the second position, second question, it strikes me that um, the idea that the liaisons who are, in, in my own case, I've worked closely for four or five years, um, have been involved, not directly, but <coughs> peripherally, um, as we made decisions around things like having a deputy chief, having a, a both, in both public safety areas, making that decision to hire those people, mm -hmm. then, you know, my opportunity to have worked closely 
um, from the from this board with two chiefs and two deputy chiefs and outside of this board over the course of 30 years highly interactive because of my other activities with police and fire and yeah. specifically around the chief um, and the deputy chief so um, from that perspective you know I've got that kind of experience and have actually been looking forward to the opportunity to represent our board um, in this process professionally speaking separately from um, my work as a, as a on this select board over the course of the last five and a half years my interview um, acumen I've probably interviewed a thousand people in the course of a business career and that's probably an underestimation um, so my interview skills tend to be strong my opportunities and instincts to observe what's going on are also strong and I, I do think you know I was really looking forward to Anne's suggestion of she and I working together on a community listening endeavor I thought that was a perfect way to get the yeah. input to come in and I thought and when Bob suggested that the two liaisons would work on his uh, selection committee it made logical sense to me and um, hope that goes forward I, I will tell you that um, I'm very interested in doing this and I think that I'm well equipped to be able to represent all five of us along with a working partner and I think Ann would Ann's background really lends itself in that same direction so yeah all right um, so I guess I'm the only one who hasn't weighed in um, so I was the liaison to public safety last year something I enjoyed um, and you did that with me I did yes um, and so you know I think this is a unique situation from a liaison perspective as far as the role of the liaison is not necessarily to make decisions on behalf of the board or to represent the board. The role of the liaison has generally, and this is actually something we talked about before, shortly after the elections, which is you liaise with whoever you are assigned to, communication goes both ways. And so I think that in that regard, representing the board as far as the selection committee is beyond the scope sp strictly speaking of the liaisons and at that point it should be up to discussion with the broader board to determine who represents us <coughs> on that understanding that it technically falls under Bob but you'd still be speaking essentially on behalf of the rest of the board not as a subcommittee but simply as individuals um, so with that said, you know, this is something I have a particular interest in. I, I don't know, Mark and Andy, where the two of you stand. Um, you know, it's absolutely something I would be wanting to do um, as far as serving on the selection committee. That's my two cents. Yeah, Mark? I mean, I, I, am, I would be happy to serve, but I don't feel that I have to. In other words, I, I'm, 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 I'm available, but I'm not suggesting that I am necessarily the person to, to participate. I think that any of the five of us will do a really good job with it. I'm not concerned with that. Um, I think the real question is what's what's the what's the structure that we want? Does it make sense to, to have you as chair participating specifically? I guess mm -hmm. that's one of the questions. Um, I think generally speaking the chair has, you know, for obvious reasons, you know, Bob chose Chuck, who is now the chair of the school committee. Um, Historically speaking, the chair and or the vice chair have been chosen for those types of roles. Yeah, I mean, to me, that probably is the most sensible route as one, but to have another person as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I would be interested, but due to job, my job, I couldn't participate per Bob's uh, yeah. explan explanation yeah. of the, the job requirement. Um, no, it's funny. I, 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 I do think we should have the chair participate, but um, obviously both of you would do a great job as well as you explained. So, um, uh, yeah, how do we? Does it this make is sense something for the, you know, Does it make sense for the chair and the vice chair to take on that role? As much as I am interested personally, I. I wanted this to be a process that everyone feels good about. And 
Does that work for everyone? John and myself. Fine with that. Yeah. I reluctantly, because yeah, I, I, you know, I, I hate to lose John, I hate to lose you, um, but I also want Vanessa involved. So, um, I, I, I can work with everybody sitting up here. You know that. All of you know that. Um, just to comment that um, this is an example of something where a third member can never sit in for the two that are chosen. So, if someone's not available, they're not available. We can't go to a third member during this process, just to make that clear. Understood. Okay. All right. So we're only about 25 minutes behind schedule. Um, unless there's any other questions as far as the police chief hiring process. All right. So I next. Oh, yeah. Let's take a two minute break.
Select board's back in session. Uh, next on the agenda, we will open a new hearing and continue a hearing regarding alleged violations of selling to underage minors um, by Bay State Liquor. So, Mark, first we're going to start with opening the new hearing, and then we will continue the hearing from July whatever date that was. What was the previous one? July. July 9th. Thank you. From July 9th. All right. Okay. To the inhabitants of the town of Reading, please take notice that the select board as the licensing authority for the town of Reading will hold a public hearing on Tuesday, August 27, 2019 at 8 p.m. in the select board's meeting room, Town Hall, 16 Mole Street, Reading, Massachusetts, to show cause why HT Reading Liquors LLC, DBA, Bay State Liquors, retail package store license to expose, keep for sale, and to sell all kinds of alcoholic beverages should not be modified, suspended, or revoked for violating section 3.1.4, which requires licensed business to conduct their business in accordance with the terms of the select board policies and section 3.2.2.5, which requires all managers, assistant managers, bouncers, bartenders, and employees permitted to sell or serve alcoholic beverages to successfully complete an approved program designed to train employees to avoid selling or serving to intoxicated persons and minors, and that all such persons required to successfully complete an alcohol management or server training Training course be successfully retained, retrained, excuse me, prior to the end of the certification period. All interested parties may appear in person, may submit their comments in writing, or may email comments to town manager at ci.reading.ma.us by order of Robert W. Lelasher, town manager. All right. Do we need a second on that? No, it's just opening it's the hearing. hearing. All right. Um, so do we have um, a motion to reopen the hearing, or are we simply reopening it? If we need a motion, I'd be happy to. Um, it's just continuing. We're just continuing? Just All right. Continue, yeah. And we are continuing the hearing from uh, the select board meeting on July 9th. Um, before we get started, I'd like to enter into testimony the RCTV feed from our previous meeting on July 9th, where additional testimony had been held. Um, so for clarification purposes, the initial hearing had two alleged violations. Um, tonight we are opening up for a third. Uh, the first two are in regard to state law. The one that we have opened this evening is to alleged violations of the select board policy the abbreviated version of what Mark read. All right, um, so at this point, um, Ivria, we can open it up to testimony mm -hmm. at your recommendation. Okay, um, first we, does the police have testimony regarding the alleged select board violations, select board policy violations? No, no, they do not. Okay, thank you. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry, Vanessa, he was going to say something. Sorry. sorry. Vanessa, it's going to be that exact what we testified to last time. Okay. Mm -hmm. If that's okay, if that's I'm going to be clarified, please let us know, but I think we're going to keep the adjustment. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, so we will next hear from the licensee or their representative regarding the alleged violations to the select board policy. Thank you. Please. Good evening. board members. If you can introduce yourself for the record, thank you. Yes, uh, Jim DiGiulio, uh, 599 North Avenue, Wakefield, Mass. I'm an attorney for the, uh, the uh, licensee. Thank you. Are we, I'm sorry, are we doing the first, uh, the uh, continuation? We will start with testimony for the alleged violation of the select board policy, um, which is in regards to the Everybody jump in here. Mm -hmm. The tips train. The tips train. Yes. Thank you. So section 3.2.5 requires that all employees be certified in one of three or one of two programs or with the approval of the select board, a third program that the individual could identify. And they need to have that completed that training within 30 days of their employment. Okay, so there was testimony presented um, at the last hearing, which has been incorporated into this new hearing, um, that the licensee, licensee may not be in compliance with this provision. Okay. 
Um, do you as a representative have testimony in regards to those allegations? Uh, no testimony from the licensee. Um, I don't know particularly what the allegation is in terms of when this alleged violation occurred. Um, was it multiple times? Was it once? Was it the individual that sold to the minor that we talked about the last time? Just a little bit confused about what dates we're talking about here and who we're talking about. Bob or Avery, can you clarify whether the licensee was informed of the alleged violations of the policy? Caitlin, yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, sir. He, he, he received notice, if that's what you're referring to, the notice of the mm -hmm. hearing? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, I'm not contesting that he didn't receive notice. Okay. I, I'm just indicating that it doesn't indicate who particularly wasn't certified and in, in what date the violation occurred. John? Um, I think it's pretty clear the last time you were here, you and your client both spoke to us about the fact that there were allegations of regarding the state laws of two separate occasions um, where minors were served. I asked the question directly of you and your um, uh, client, the licensee, whether or not the people in question that served on those two dates were TIPS trained. I was told they were not. That was a direct violation of our policy. So what we're here to talk about relative to that um, policy violation, we know by previous testimony here that the people that served th those minors were not TIPS trained. Well, you told us that the last time you were here. So I guess the real question that I have is, are you changing your story on that or is that true? Because if that's true, what you told us the last time, you're in direct violation of the select board policy. Not changing the, uh, the story at all. I don't recall any testimony regarding the, the individual the first time. I do recall you asking my client, or I believe this gentleman, uh, Mr. Friedman, yes. had asked my client, were any of the two yeah. that were there that night, I believe, that were there that night that sold to the young woman, were they TEP certified? And the answer was no. That's what I remember. And I've, I've reviewed the tape a, a number of times. Mm -hmm. um, so with regard to that, if that's what we're talking about, no, we're not changing our testimony. They were not TIP certified. Okay. However, as a matter of, uh, and, and, I, and I'm glad you clarified in terms of what we were talking about here, um, the policy states that they have 30 days to certify. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, the testimony was the last time that this particular person who sold was temporary. It, it, and again, I use the word hanging around, friendly person, but we admitted that he served the alcohol. He was a server. But um, the policy allows 30 days. He was there for two weeks. So we don't believe that he was in violation or there was a violation of that policy because the 30 days had not expired. And we don't believe there's any evidence in the record to suggest that um, that the 30 day, that he was, he, he was outside the 30 day period. Was he employed, this person employed? Did they get a paycheck? It, you know, I didn't know that at the time. You asked at that time, I wasn't even sure was he paid. Was he ever paid? No. So you had a non-employee who was never on the payroll and was never tips trained selling alcohol to the public and in this case to minors. Do I have that pretty correct? He was a family member. He's not an employee. He's not paid. He's not trained. Yet you have him at your cash register serving alcohol to the public and in this case to minors. Do I have that correct? We admitted it the last time he was an employee. He was an employee. He was a temporary employee. But he's not on the payroll. He's not a he's not a person that, I mean what is it? Is he an employee? Is he not an employee? It's a family member. And when does he help? Does he help when he's in town? Did that happen only for two weeks? Did that happen 
a month ago, six weeks ago, before this happened. I mean, it's so, so oh, unclear. Oh, thank you, John. So as a point of clarification, there are two alleged violations. One is on May 18th, the other is on May 30th. The gentleman in question um, who was, as you say, a temporary employee, um, was that the same seller, same uh, person at the register for both of those occasions? We don't know that. And, and I explained um, to the board that when um, we reviewed the tape to see who that person was on that earlier date, the tape um, <coughs> uh, records over itself after 30 days. Uh, so by time uh, my client got the notice from the board. If you look at the date of the notice, the 30 days had expired from that first date. However, I did indicate to the board that uh, the police had the opportunity to look at the tape and perhaps they saw who that person was, but we didn't know and we tried to ascertain that person. We weren't able to do that because of the tape. So, and that's what I stated the last time we were here. Thank you. Do we know who the individual was uh, who was selling the alcohol allegedly to minors on the 18th? Okay. So we only know of the person on the 30th. Okay. That's the question. So has that particular person been there um, working and serving before or after? He he was fired right after we learned about this incident. And again, we How about before? Before. Before the 18th. Before that, the first date. Was he sometimes serving alcohol to people for them? No, he was there for, he was, well, I'm, I'm not sure I understand your question. He was there for approximately two weeks. <coughs> okay, and that's the window, do we know? Yes. The 18th to the 30th, roughly. That, that's what my client that's tells correct. me. That's correct. So the person who was there on the 18th was fired, correct? That's the temporary? Is the 18th the second date? No, the 30th the is the second date. date. The eight, it's, it was May 18th and May 30th. No, the, the person on the 30th was fired. Yes. We could not ascertain who the employee was on the 8th. And again, because of the tape, and we thought perhaps the police would, a, would be able to do that. Thank you. John? So I have a question about that. Um, and for you or for the your client, do you maintain payroll records for employees? Yes. Okay, so um, that's good. And I'm assuming, are they paid by the hour or are they paid by the shift? How are they paid? Uh, paid hourly. Okay, so in order to be paid hourly, they have to clock in somewhere. So this is pretty simple arithmetic. You go back to the 18th, you look at the payroll records, you look at the time in question, and it will tell you exactly who was working, wouldn't it? And it could have been one or more people. Okay, were they, were any, was anybody, if there were two people on shift at that time, were either of them tips trained? Well, Mr. Halsey, I apologize for interrupting you, but my client isn't testifying tonight. He had testified the last time we were here, and unfortunately, um, he, he, was, he was honest. Uh, he told you the truth, and unfortunately, his words are now being used against him. So he has given his testimony, and, and that is his testimony. So for, unfortunately, he was honest. Is that what I'm hearing you no, say? No, no. He was honest. Unfortunately, because his words are now being used against him, uh, he has... So this is a hearing about the violations against the select board policies, right. which I know specifically your client is aware of because the day that he was granted that license, I had a direct conversation with him in this room about TIPS training. And I'm sure he mentioned that he recalled that the last time we, we talked. He did. Now, going forward, I think it is imperative that somebody testify on his behalf, either you or your client, as to the question here of the select board's policy. Now, the select board policy is separate from what went on last time. I mean, it's pretty simple to ascertain that it was one of two people that it sounds like if there were two people on the 18th and because we don't have a videotape, we can't be certain which of them actually served the alcohol to the minor, but there were two people. So my question is a simple one. We know that it could have been 
you know, the person who doesn't isn't tip strained. We know that there was such a person who supposedly was only here for two weeks, which I guess started on the 17th and ended on the on the 30th, um, because that maybe is the two weeks in question that the person worked there. But there was a second person you're telling me that could have served on the 18th. So my question directly to either you or to your client is, was the second person who was on shift that night tips trained? Well, again, I just want to make the record clear. I said it could have been one or more people. I'm not saying it was more. If I could have a moment, I could speak with my client. Maybe we can clarify this and get an answer. So it seems like the answer to do we know uh, who served on May 18th potentially violating select board policy, the answer is that there is an unknown factor there. For May 30th, we do in fact know that the person who served the alcohol was not tips trained. However, um, the applicant is claiming that he had only served for two weeks. We do not have any my interpretation is given the information as far as the violation of the select board policy, we have no the policy was violated. For this particular note that there are three questions before us. One of them is select board policy violations, the other two are the alleged violations on the 18th and 30th, we will, which we will take up separately. So I, we are limited in, in the information that we have available to us. I'm interested in what the rest of the board has to say, but I don't, if we're going strictly by the law, we cannot. And may I just stop, add, the, there. everyone that now will be serving alcohol is TAM certified, and we have some of the records. Um, some of them were mailed directly to the <coughs> individual, so we don't have all of them, but I believe your regulations require that we file them with the board, and that will be done. They are all TAM certified. Thank you. Other, other uh, comments? Yeah. On August 19th, 2019, in our packet, we have a letter from town council on uh, advising the board on the issue, uh, a number of issues, the, the three that you stated, but <clears throat> the one that we're currently discussing, and I'd just like to read the sentence that, or the two sentences he, 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 he wrote, the same standard of re review applies to violations of the select board policies. Thus, if substantial evidence presented in the record demonstrate that individuals who have been employed more than 30 days by the licensee are not properly trained, the select board may find that licensee violated its policies. And uh, <clears throat> we don't seem to have met that bar. Other thoughts? Yes, I think that we don't have sufficient information to come to that conclusion. You know, I would say this, that the hearing on this particular topic needs to be continued, and here's why I say that. Um, we need to have the employment records of who was working on July 18th. I'm sure, I know you have to have those. Okay, you know who works for you, you pay them. I'm sure you're complying with all the state tax laws as far as that's concerned. I'm certain of that. Therefore, even though it's understandable that you wouldn't have that information on the top of your head, or you know, maybe even in a file that you're carrying with you tonight, even though this is what we're talking about, I understand that. But I do know those records exist. And I would like, I am very interested to know on the 18th, who was doing the serving. Now, I get that the, the videotape does not allow us to know which of several people who might have been working that night actually dispensed the alcohol. But what, to the point of what um, Andy just read, <coughs> the, the select board policy is that all employees serving alcohol in the establishment in question have to have the appropriate training within 30 days of their employment. So what I'm interested to know, and I suggest we continue this hearing, I wanna know who was working the night of the 18th, how long they've been working, I, wanna, I want their employment records. And I also am interested to know, um, the last time we were here, 
we were told by the licensee that he was the only person that was licensed or that was trained and certified. Okay, I could have that wrong, but I'm, what I, the suggestion was that not everyone had been trained. Okay, that not everyone had been trained. So let me not be, you know, I, I don't want to jump to a conclusion. I'd rather have the actual information, and I know that information is available. So I don't want to come to a conclusion on this hearing, this portion of the hearing that we opened tonight about select board policy until we see those employment records and understand, forget who sold the alcohol to the minor on the 18th. I want to know how many employees worked there for how long and who was TIPS trained and who wasn't because that is the question. The quintessential question of this hearing is whether or not that's been accomplished. And so I don't think we can ascertain that information tonight. Thank you, John. Um, and Mark, do you have thoughts on this? I think John's point is very well taken. The, the, the point of this hearing is to, to be able to respond to these questions and we're not we're not in a position to respond to them it doesn't mean that we have to find that we don't have evidence it means we have to get the evidence it, it, and I would say to that as you know the burden is on the board the board has noticed this the board has made this allegation and this statute is also a criminal statute so now you're putting my client in a situation he wants to cooperate as I said he came here he was under oath he answered all your questions honestly and those questions those answers are now being used against him to alleged separate violation but that's it's also a criminal violation so for him to give evidence against himself I would advise him not to do that because it's a criminal statute and of course you could be prosecuted and I would like to hear from our town council I believe we're talking about a violation of a select board policy not a criminal indictment yeah, can we, can you wait? right so there are oh, sorry can I, can I just add something and the way your policy reads is we have to have the tips or other certification on file not just that it exists, we have to have it on file. And we have one record on file for one individual, and that expired July 18, 2019. July 8th. Uh, so, oh, sorry, July, July 8th, 8th 2019. We have nothing else on file. So there's zero people certified right now. Everett, can you weigh in as to the criminal? implication here yes yeah, so that we have combined both of the hearings so it is within his right to refuse to provide testimony on that um, if the board continues the hearing we can look into what additional evidence we are able to collect I I do um, I do understand that we've already noticed the hearing so typically we like to collect all the evidence before we open hearings it's sort of unusual to use this as an open process it's been a unique situation because during the last hearing we learned that few of the employees were tip certified um, but it seems like Caitlin does have some additional evidence that the board may want to consider and enter into evidence can you clarify for us now um, if anyone currently employed and serving alcohol is tips or tams certified is that the other tam is for the package stores tips is for like restaurants yeah. okay. um, can you clarify if anyone is currently tam certified yes every employee is tam certified and the reason he chose tam was because he had a choice under your policy mm -hmm. tips or tam mm -hmm. and I, I've taken tips, so I, I know a little bit, long time ago, know a little bit about it. And they, uh, the tips program focuses um, heavily on service of alcohol and looking for signs of intoxication, and how to handle intoxicated people. And the TAMS program is more geared, in my understanding, I've never taken that program, it's more uh, geared for package stores. So he believed that that was the best program, but um, they fine. are all, and as I said, they will be filed, all of those certifications. I have a question on the filing. Um, it says in our policy the licensee shall, sh shall certify annually to the uh, select board at the time of renewal of the license that it satisfies this requirement. Certi certificates shall be kept on file. It doesn't state where and available for inspection upon request. So I'd like town council's opinion on this. It says certificates shall be kept on file and available for inspection upon request. 
does that does that mean the store keeps it on file and is and they're available for inspection or upon request or does that mean the town keeps the certificates on file and they are available so my the way I read this is that there's certification that's part of the renewal package and Caitlin and Bob can speak to it more mm -hmm. and that that includes both the certification and the actual certificate so uh, but they give it to us every year we get a copy they can keep the originals we get a copy mm -hmm. of their tips every renewal season mm -hmm. and they go into their file so that we can go back every year I pull out a packet of the information they're supposed to give us every single year mm -hmm. and it's supposed to have every employee in their tip certifications and on it says when they expire when they expire it's supposed to give us new ones but we ask for them every year anyway so we wouldn't expect to have the new one until the new applicants season i mean there's we're coming upon renewal but this expired in july mm -hmm. so we should have a new one okay. but when they gave it us this it was still accurate and mm -hmm. Uh, as a point, inspired. Caitlin, thank yeah. you. As a point of clarification, um, for all of the liquor licenses that we issue, um, from a general practice perspective, how timely are people in submitting them prior to their expiration date? Um, they're good for years, so. I mean, do we generally chase down businesses who haven't submitted this? So do we require it as? Okay. Um, I'm asking, as we review these annually, and this might be a better question for annually. Bob, um, do they, are they required as part of that process to submit them? Yes. yes. And that takes place in the fall, correct? We're no, gearing up to do them right correct. now. Okay. So presumably the um, licenses, <coughs> the, the training are not necessarily all conducted at the same time, correct? I'm sure that's right. All right. So we ask essentially that their paperwork be in order before they ask for renewal. Correct. So there's a little bit of a window there. Well, they're as. always supposed to be current. They're never right. supposed to be a time where this is expired and they have to go to another training. They're supposed to be mm -hmm. always. And once, I believe, once they take the test the first time, that's the renewal is much easier to keep it up to date. So Perfect. they're always supposed to be up to date. So when we ask for them every year, there shouldn't be no lack of time where there should be no certificate but there is a scenario in which they could have the certificate the they could have it and, and just we as the to town us. don't have it yes I okay that. okay John. I, I have a question um so at the maybe you have this information with you maybe you don't mm -hmm. um it, and it would be understandable if you didn't at the last renewal of this liquor license yes how many individuals were yeah. certified and could you give me the name of that person so Hill Patel. and who was that that was the uh, last time he had testified that so Hill uh, is his relative yes uh, okay so there's there was one person mm -hmm. who was a relative who was certified in the last packet mm -hmm. so theoretically anybody that had been working there other than this person for 30 days or longer sure. was not on record with us at all and last December when we renewed this um, this person was the only person certified to be able to, to dispense alcohol across the counter at that place of business is that a fair assumption Yes. And so if that's the case, it seems to me, I mean, is it possible that that person was, I mean, does that person do all the work? Obviously not. Well, hold on, John, I, I want to take a step back here. So, again, the issue before us is three alleged violations. One for the select board policy and two for selling to mi allegedly selling to minors on May 18th and May 30th, 2019. So... We need to determine as a board if we think violations occurred on these three instances and we need to take them independently. Okay. All right. Are there additional specific questions that we have for the licensee's representative in regards to, let's take them one at a time, the select board policy violations? I have no more questions. I have the information I need. Okay. Anybody else? I'm sorry. Oh, sorry you, you said we have to take these questions individually 
for each date, but we don't actually have a date attached to the um, to the alleged violation of the select board policy. Correct. Yeah. Right. So uh, when what I think Vanessa means is we have to break it down into three separate votes. So you're going to vote once on the first sale of the minor, once on the se second sale of the minor, and then once on whether the select board's policies have been violated. We don't need to associate it with a specific date, um, okay. though it, there does seem to be a date circulating the fact uh, reflected in the. In the okay. Uh, Be before you ask the question, mm -hmm. John suggested um, obtaining the employment records uh, of the store to determine whether or not uh, to get it, it to determine whether or not we can um, demonstrate that the our policy has been violated. Is that essentially? But council has told us that they won't provide that because they, he feels it's self-incriminating. However, you know, all we have to look at is on July 8th, there were zero on file. Today, there are zero on file. And so to me, it's a clear-cut case of a violation that probably happened on July 9th. So John, I just, uh, sorry if I could just make one point. So um, the policy itself doesn't actually require that when a new TAM certificate is issued that it be refiled. The requirement is that annually you provide the certificate um, and that employees are properly trained and those trainings are kept up to date. Thank you. Um, as a point of clarification, um, Andy, you have the policy handy? I do. Okay. Um, can you clarify whether there are indications for penalties for violating the select board policy? Or no. if, I'm curious if any indicator or not. I don't have it in front of me. So is it, I think, liquor liability in here? No. Yeah, that's perfect. There's a table. I didn't town council answer that? Did you answer in the that letter? Um, yeah, right. it, the first, yeah. first, the first offense was uh, one to five days. One to five days, days suspension. But is that part of our policy, or is that part of the state law violation? So your policy. So your policy has established um, suggested orders for different levels of offenses, and this applies to any violation, whether it's a state violation or a violation of your select board policies, section 3.2.4.2. Got it. Um, right. So. Madam Chair, uh, because a new issue, I believe, has been raised, may I address it very briefly? So. I understand that there might now be a new allegation that my different violation, which would be filing with the board. Um, however, the notice does not say that at all. It, when you talk about violating the policies, yes, that provision is in the policies, but it further goes on to say thus, uh, failed to comply with the policies and thus section 3.1.4 are statements that you made. So the notice is notifying us that there's an alleged violation of the tips, not persons not being certified, not not filing. So I don't believe that's an issue before the, the, the board. I would also mention that, and I think council will agree with me, that the uh, penalties are suggested, they're not mandatory, they're mm -hmm. a guideline. Yeah, okay. Um, so there's been mention of potentially extending this hearing uh, on the alleged violations of the select board policy. I am, as one member, not inclined to go that route. I would rather vote this evening. Uh, on that particular issue. Are there other thoughts on the continuance or not of the alleged violation of the select board policy? I think that we we don't have information that would be necessary, the, the, the employment records, particularly because um, this is tied to a point in time within 30 days. Um, it's hard to find a violation without, um, but it sounds like they would not be provided. She don't know that um, 
a continuation for us from an evidentiary standpoint if that evidence were to be provided it sounds like it would not be so I'm disinclined to move for a continuation okay. I'm disinclined to move for a continuation I think that we have, the, we have the information I think that we're going to have and I think we, we move forward based on that this evening this evening Andy? Um, I'd like to say that Ann stole every single word out of my mouth <laughs> and I agree you know I'm in concurrence with what she said okay um, so it seems we're disinclined to continue um, which means we would need to vote this evening on whether or not there was a violation of the select board policy or in regards to the 30-day requirement to have uh, tips or TAMS training so unless there's any further discussion on that particular point um, we can close the hearing for that particular item. Move that the board close the hearing regarding Bay State Liquor's alleged violations. Uh, uh, public comment. Uh, thank you. Oh, Bob, oh, 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 uh, is there public comment? No second on that. All right. Uh, we can have a second now. Uh, so sorry. Uh, oh. Is the motion to close both hearings or is it to just close the specific hearing on the select board's policy? Is it we should specify? That? It should just be, should be on the select board policy. Yeah. Okay, move that the board close the hearing on the select board policy <coughs> regarding Bay State Liquor's alleged violations. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor? Okay. Close it on. Motion carries. Uh, so now, do we have a motion? Now, discussion. We're going to have more? Well, <laughs> that was a public hearing. When we close the public hearing, the select the people the members of the select board have a discussion as to where we're going and why we're going to get there and how we're going to get there and what their opinions are. I mean, you All have right. to have a discussion, don't then you? That's it. Were you Tom. Did you want to take these finish these separately? What was your intention? Well, uh, we have been. It has been requested that we handle them individually and that vote on them. In, you know, at the end of the at the end of the hearing, vote on them and then move to the next one. Six one half dozen of the other, unless right. It doesn't matter. You could uh, continue taking testimony related to the sale to a minor, or you can uh, discuss the matter related to the select board policy by vi alleged violation and then vote on that. It's it's okay. really up to the board's discretion. I would leave it up to uh, the chair. What you want to do? Um, I'd be inclined to finish with this one before moving on to the next one. Okay. I just want to reserve the right to have discussion before we vote on That's any fair. penalties. Or um, so <laughs> oh, the voting on penalties is a separate vote. I understand that. So, all right. So discussion on whether we believe an alleged violation occurred of the select board policies. I have a question for town council. Could you remind us of the standard of proof? Yeah, so um, it's substantial evidence in this case. Okay. Yeah. Can you translate that for the non lawyers? Yeah, members? yeah. Um, so substantial evidence, I just want to make sure we're citing the case correctly. Um, is such evidence as a reasonable mind might accept as adequate to support a conclusion? <clears throat> and um, we get that from embers of Salisbury v. ABCC. And that's mm -hmm. that's for the violation of the select board policy. Exactly, it would okay. be for a violation of select board policy as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, discussion. Do we believe an, a violation of the select board policy occurred, given what we heard this evening? Based on what I just heard, Vera tell us, and what I heard about the existing file, in my opinion, there's no question that our board that our that our policy has been violated. Okay. Um, and I would vote in that direction that our policy has been violated. Other opinions? Uh, same opinion, uh, basically. I think that the information, <coughs> excuse me, the information we have is that um, there's only one person who was trained on the date of the alleged violation. The evidence that we do have indicates that even if that was the person serving, um, they weren't certified. So it seems clear to me that there's a, a violation of our policy right there. And we'd be voting in that direction. Other thoughts? I, yeah. I'd like to note that the, in, in that case, uh, that person has 30 days to certify, and, and the individual was there for two, two weeks. So um, I don't think we can apply that. Uh, no one was certified, criteria. including full-time employees. Well, 
I think the struggle is that we have no proof whether someone was certified or not. Yeah. Because the there was no paperwork filed with the town, and so it is possible that they were certified. We were just we as the town were unaware of it. There's the opportunity to provide that information that hasn't been taken advantage of. And. Yeah. Well, that's uh, to me. That's substantial. E th that would be the substantial evidence um, that w would make or break the case. Um, also, you know, the reasonable person uh, standard. Uh, that, that's that. In my mind, it rings of sort of beyond a reasonable doubt, you have to be pretty certain that the, you, there's substantial evidence to, to suggest that they violated um, our, our policy here. Yeah, so I would say that beyond a reasonable doubt is a higher standard higher. than substantial evidence. Okay. Thank you. Well, it's, it's not a murder. A lot higher, probably. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, 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 um, <laughs> yeah, John, I John, think John, it was it probably that. a lot higher. Just, but even that being said, I, I think that there is strong circumstantial evidence, but I don't, um, I, I, I'm inclined to vote not in, in terms of not finding um, a violation just because we what we have I think solid evidence of is that there was someone who was not TIP certified serving uh, who had been there for two weeks and our policy allows for 30 for someone to be certified within 30 days um, and we know that there was only one person at the uh, who was certified at the time um, that um, that of annual certification, but that was also a finite point in time. So I think it, the, the timing um, and the evidence are such that it's, for me, it's insufficient. Okay. Uh, so I'm inclined to agree with Anne here. I think the, my instinct is to say that there probably was a violation. Given the evidence that was presented to us, I do not feel that we have enough concrete evidence to vote in that direction. So I would be inclined to say there was no violation even though mm -hmm. for a practical perspective, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's clear that there was. I just don't know if there's enough evidence to indicate. Please. Um, I think that reasonability and we talk about a renewal with one person being certified with an expectation that that person theoretically would have to be is there a violation or not well unless one person was manning that liquor store from last December till the current question um, I think it's unreasonable to think that that one person could have done that whole thing by themselves given the hours that that's open and so forth. And I think based on that, it's clear evidence that our policy has been violated. And I think, you know, it's, it's incidental that we happen to have two other violations that is what has brought this to our attention. So I think that you got to erase the discussion of the 18th and the 30th from whether or not there's been a violation of the selectman's policy. And I, in my opinion, mine only, if we have a renewal with one person, I doubt that that person has been running that liquor store 100% by themselves from the time of renewal to the any point in time so and that to me is a clear violation of our policy thank you john uh any further discussion before we vote on whether or not there was a violation that occurred of the just one point i think it would be very useful if we had the employment records to mm -hmm. see at the time of renewal who had been working there i don't know how much turnover there is if the, you know you know this the person um, who's, who would be in violation if it had been over 30 days, had only been there two weeks, how much turnover is in this, is, is in this um, 
establishment. So I, I feel like I can't I can't come to um, remind me again of the, the standard. I can't substantial, substantial evidence. evidence. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like we don't have that. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, so do we have a motion? Well, first we need to agree. Do we have, so I know where Mark and John and myself stand. Andy, I am unclear on where you stand on this. And the reason I ask is because we need to have a motion one way or the other. Right. Um, I, I think it's important for the public to hear that the select board, it does, the members who have expressed a desire not to find them in violation of our select board policies, um, that the select board doesn't takes these sale of alcohol to minors very seriously. I have kids who have re recently graduated from high school. It's a problem in town. They buy kids have access to alcohol in town. Underage kids. Uh, it, it's it's not a it's it's no secret. So I don't feel. Um, please don't take uh, what I'm about to say is going soft on this problem. I think we, it, we, what this says to me is we, our efforts need to be redoubled in this area uh, with the help from the police department. And that um, in this case, uh, convince myself to say that we have substantial evidence to find them in violation. Okay. So, um, in that, so I'm reading through the motions to, under, to make sure because we have numerous. Is it 1C1? Um, I think it's moved that the board find base tape liquors not in violation of select board policy section 3.2.2.5 and section 3.14. Okay. Yeah, you could also take it in the affirmative, and if it fails, it's the same thing as a denial. It's however the board wants to frame the motion. Okay. So how is it written? Page seven? They find them in violation. It's right. the uh, page two, the last. Right. So that's a fine motion. You can make that motion, and if it fails, it, it fails. All right, so can you make the motion? We'll have a second, and then we'll clarify exactly what we're voting on. Move that the board find Bay State Liquors in violation of Select Board Policy Section 3.2.2.5 and Section 3.14. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Um, so to clarify before we vote, if you vote in favor of this motion, you are saying that Bay State Liquors was in violation of the select board policy noted. Clear? Clear. All right. All those in favor? Okay. Thank you. Opposed? The motion uh, does not carry. All right. So now we will move on to uh, the alleged violation of selling to minors on May 18th. So we have already heard testimony on July 9th. Uh, is there any additional testimony that the licensee representative would like to provide? Yes, Madam Chair. Um, at the last hearing, I had mentioned that um, we had uh, taken a screenshot of the video that we did have. I believe it was the 30th, the 31st, the later one. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't know what I did with the um, photographs. I did leave them at my client's um, uh, office, so I do have them. And I thought they would be important for you to see. Um, and again, Mr. Halsey, I know you were very concerned about um, our position regarding how the per person looks, and, and I understand that, and that's, but that wasn't what we relied upon. My client carded these two individuals. These two individuals told the police that they were carded, um, and the second individual told the police that she was carded and that they both had fake IDs. Um, and the officer testified, and I don't believe it's in the report, but the officer testified, the detective, I believe, testified that the, the woman who is depicted in this picture, this was the second incident, um, had indicated that she had been carded in the past, but after a while, they stopped carding her. So I think it's important to know that it wasn't just a visual that my client did. They had a written policy. They carded people. They carded these particular individuals. Not on that particular night, but the, the law doesn't require that and the board's policy doesn't require that. 
Um, so that's why I think seeing a visual of this person who we know, we know now was 20 years old, if, if it was obvious to my client that this person from the looks looked extremely young, then I would say, okay, but that's why I think it's important and I wanted to present these the last time and I didn't have them with me if I could put them into the record. Yes. Okay. Sorry, can, I, can, I, can I ask a question? Of course. So you're telling me that this person had been carded on other occasions. That's the police told us that. Okay. And I read that police report as well that this person indicated that at a certain point in time they'd used fake identification and had presented it and that they no longer needed to do that because uh, apparently they were known. <coughs> So my question about the person on July 30th, how long did he know them? Two weeks, 30 days? I got the impression in reading the police report that this had, you know, that this person had been coming there for quite some time and that no longer needed to be carded. And I'm guessing if you don't card, you don't card at your own peril. And we, I think, agree and understand that, that you can make a decision that you're not going to card somebody how they look is absolutely immaterial um, but you can make that decision you're not required by law but you live with the consequences of that decision I believe is the way this is written I, I agree with you I, I don't agree that the way a person looks is not a relevant factor well <laughs> fine but you, you you proceed at your own peril if you decide that somebody looks old enough and you don't guard them and it turns out that that's not true game the game is over all right do we have a area uh, I just wanted to address some points that were made I know uh, I wrote it in the letter but um, the last time around um, it seemed like the standard that was being reiterated was that there had to be some type of knowing requirement that um, if the person if the, if the person that was selling the alcohol to the minor in question didn't know that the minor was a minor, that that would uh, relieve the, you know, would, would, would um, uh, result in no violation under the statute. And as I explained in the letter, while that's the standard for furnishing alcohol to a minor, you have to knowingly furnish, that's not the standard for sale to a minor. The standard is different. And, you know, that the Supreme Judicial Court has said that there's no standard requirement, there's no knowledge requirement associated with sale to a minor. And the ABCC has re reiterated that. And, and I think just as as um, John John just said, you know, the only way out of this type of violation is reasonable reliance on one of the six types of identification identified in Section 34B of the statute. And so, if if that didn't occur, then and you sold to a minor, you're you're on the hook. Um, and it's important to point out that there is case law. Um, it's a a, a mass um, appellate court or appellate court case, the appeals court. They said that. Um, prior reliance on a fake ID on a different day didn't um, wasn't enough. You have to card them every day to be able to rely on that protection that Section 34B affords licensees. So I just wanted to clarify that for the record. Thank you. Are there additional questions from the board as far as the alleged violations on May 18th? And please note, again, we are taking these separately. So... As far as the police reports go, we are reviewing only that of May 18th. So on the 18th, um, they were carded, and the 30 so first they were not. Just a point of clarification, the picture that you're looking at is not the individual that was involved on the 18th, because right. you had stated earlier there was no video available of the incident on the 18th, correct? Uh, yeah, I indicated that was the later okay. incident. Okay. Uh, we believe. Sure Thank you. That, that was what you're talking about. Because the, the other evidence that you also just testified to was for both incidents or for the first incident? With regard to? With regard to someone saying that they had used an ID in the past. I believe. was not asked for an ID. I, bu I believe uh, the police reports indicate that each of the individuals on the 18th and on the 30th, the 31st, had indicated that they had a fake ID and had used it in the past. That would be correct for the first incident, but not the second incident. Okay. So that would be the individual that you're looking at is involved in the second incident. That individual never stated that they had been asked for ID in the past. 
they said they had an ID, but they were not, it was not requested. Yeah. On the 18th, it was not requested. No, on the second day. No, on the 30th. 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 Some of the issues get confused because you issued the picture of the individual involved on the second day, but if you're only discussing the first day right now, then I'm not sure why. It's not that material. Thank you for that. Yes, I, I, that, that's the second incident. I thought you were taking both. No, we, separate we, need to, we need to separate them. Um, all right, so we'll, we'll table the photo uh, for now. Yes. All right. Uh, does the board have any additional questions in regards to the alleged violations on the 18th? I, I just... Looking at the police report, I think from the from the 18th, it says the underage youth stated they were no longer being asked for ID by the staff, so they no longer used any identification when purchasing alcohol. Correct. Okay. Further questions on this side? That was my question. Yeah. No? Okay. So, so that was on the that the was the early earlier. The 18th. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question for town council is, um, when it says. <coughs> The only defense avail available to a charge of sale to a minor is whether the licensee reasonably relied right. on one of the six pieces. Right. Does that mean, uh, does reasonably rely uh, pertain to every time they have to show that license or that they show it ten times and after that they don't have to keep No, showing? every time. So the reasonable standard comes into, let's say I'm minor and I give you my older sister's ID and I look nothing like her, mm -hmm. then it would be unreasonable for the licensee or the licensee's agent to rely on that piece of identification. The um, the section section 34b was adopted so you know licensees that are relying on really good fake identifications can rely on those and, and have that protection but if the fake isn't good it's clear that the individual presenting the fake isn't that individual then that's not reasonable to rely on that so, that so they have to present it every time they purchase. correct and that, that that was upheld in an appeals court case correct. and the uh, 18th was definitely they were not carded that's the way I understand the police report. According to the police report, yes. According to what the youth said. Right. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, before we open it up to public comment, is there any further discussion from the board on the May 18th? Okay. Is there any public comment? All right. We close the hearing. Oh, um, oh, I'm sorry. We should, um, because this was all one hearing, we should now take evidence on the second alleged violation, and then you'll close the hearing. Oh, to be open um, together. Okay. Uh, okay, so shifting gears. We will now take evidence for the alleged violations on May 30th. 31st or 30th? It's the 30th. Um, I know it says the 31st here. It should be the 30th. All right. Um, is there any additional evidence that the licensee's representative would like to enter? No evidence, but I would like to address at the appropriate time the st standard of law to be applied, if I may. Please. So, um, I, I'm not aware of the appellate court case that she's referring to. I did not receive a package, and I didn't expect to receive a package from counsel. That was for, for your counsel. Um, however, I just want to clarify the statute that counsel's referring to um, is actually discussed um, on the ABCC website. And um, when it, what, what it says is that neither the State Liquor Control Act nor the regulations of ABCC require identification to be checked as a condition to selling or delivering alcohol beverages to any person. Um, each licensee is left to decide uh, for itself what policy to establish on checking it. Um, however, it goes on to say that while the licensee may choose to rely upon any form of identification to obtain proof of age, only these specific six forms uh, provide a defense to a charge of service. So what, and, and that's in the statute, and what that means to me is that you're not in violation if you if you don't ask for any one of this for any one of the six and you reasonably were it as counsel had indicated you know if it didn't look like a different person um, then you're protected by the statute and in and, and, and this statute really um, is is most often applied to dram shop cases where uh, uh, establishments are sued for liquor liability uh, and, and and that's where it's applied mostly but again I 
I just want to be clear that this, it, it, we don't have to, th this statute says that if we asked for these identifications and we were reasonable, um, we're protected under this statute. However, it doesn't mean we're not protected because we didn't ask for one of these. And, and I think council will agree. Uh, I would agree that um, the license, there's no obligation in the statute to ask for identification. But if you don't ask for identification, you're proceeding at your own risk. And so if you sail to a minor, that's something that you're risking. The only way to protect yourself from um, being found in violation if you do sell to a minor is to rely on one of those six forms of identification that's you know talked about on the ABCC's website and in uh, Section 34B. You'll notice that out-of-state licenses aren't one of the six forms of identification that you can rely under uh, rely on under Section 34B. So you can definitely take a Connecticut ID and, and rely on it, but if it's a fake and it could be the best fake in the whole entire world, but if it's a fake and the individual's a minor, that doesn't get you the protection of Section 34B. Um, so I th I'm... All right. Yeah. In, uh, Thank sorry, you. Sorry, Madam Chair. So a little bit more on the law. So uh, Mr. Halsey had asked me the last time if I um, had cases that I had um, cited the last time, and I did not have them available <coughs> for the board, but I do have them. And um, I have the statute, Section 34. Um, I have um, some uh, notes of decision that are attached to that as well. And then I have the case um, that I cited the last time, which talks about the fact that specific intent is required for a violation. It's not strict liability. And uh, going to counsel's uh, point regarding the knowingly and intentionally, uh, the case does not distinguish between knowingly and intentionally, and I have the case here as well. But I also would like to point out that there's two parts to this statute. And the first part says that uh, uh, whoever makes a sale or delivery of alcohol beverage or alcohol to a person under the age of 21, um, and, he, uh, and it goes on to talk about the different sections of the of the license licenses, <laughs> any such beverages or alcohol for use by a person who he knows or has reason to believe is under 21 years of age. So that's a scienter requirement. That's a knowledge requirement. That's an intent requirement. Uh, that's in the first part of the statute. Then when you go to the second part of the statute, it, and then it goes on to say, or whoever furnishes any such beverage or alcohol for a person under the age of 21 shall be punished by a fine uh, or imprisonment. Um, and for the purposes of this section, and again, this is rules of construction um, on statutes, for purposes of this section, not this paragraph, but this section, 34, uh, the word furnish shall mean to knowingly and intentionally supply, give, or provide, um, or allow a person under the age of 21. Um, so I would say that both parts of the statute, if, if council is distinguishing furnishing from selling, um, then if you if you read the entire section, I, I believe that the Sienta requirement does apply, and I think that case that I've attached to it indicates that. But also, if you look at the other section, um, it says that uh, any such beverage or alcohol for use of a person who he knows or has reason to believe is under the age of 21. And I would also say that in, I believe it was 19, 97, um, it was a strict liability statute, and it was amended, and it was changed. And uh, so um, I do have that uh, law for each of the board members, if I may. Rob, would you like to enter that into evidence? I would, please. Okay. So noted. All right. Um, we're about an hour over on our agenda. That's okay. Um, and we've gone down a bit of a legalese rabbit hole. So... I'm going to bring it back to the issue before us, which is, we as a board need to determine if there was an alleged, if there was a violation on May 30th where they in fact sold two minors. Um, any further discussion from the board before I open it up to public comment? Yes. So, um, what's difficult here is 
you know, working through the back and forth of all these cases, which I appreciate that we have to do. But there's, there's one statement that I thought was very apt here. The central issue is whether the licensee acted with due care to prevent the sale of alcohol to minors. Um, and I think from the testimony we've heard and what we've evaluated, I don't think that that's the case. And that I think requiring the showing of, the, of one of the six IDs, I think that even some of the statements made that your client has since done, which I applaud, and that many other liquor stores in town have already done, is to just make it clear how things are going to be treated. And from the evidence from the police, it doesn't feel to me that that is what took place at this time. Um, and I, you know, I think we're going to, there are some back and forth here that's going to be you know, the legalistic determination. But I, I find that that's, that's the problem that I have here. And that I read through that the, the sale, based on some case law that we have cited here as well, um, is different. Um, and that it, it kind of pushes me very clearly toward the notion that um, violations did occur. Thank you, Mark. Other thoughts? Alleged violations of May 30th. I think it's very clear that there was a violation. Thank you. And Andy? I have another question for town council. Um, because I want to get this, this mm -hmm. right, and I'm, I'm um, not a lawyer, mm -hmm. obviously. This handout that was just provided, mm -hmm. um, is this the law in its current form? Um, I assume that's the law in its current form. It looks like it's downloaded from Westlaw. Yeah, and um, thank you. And um, in the in the letter that we circulated, um, we broke that law down, uh, yeah. that statute down. You can see how we believe that there's the separate sections, and then the case law that we cited, uh, and including a recent SJC case, which said there's no scienter requirement for Section 34. No scienter. I'm sorry. Sorry, no knowledge requirement. Uh, okay. Yeah. The CNT sanctions. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. got it. Um, yeah, because it's it's tough for a lay person to look at this where it says uh, there's a lot of knowingly and intentionally here. So please um, don't start reading it again. I, I, I promise <laughs> I will not. But there's also uh, it se they seem to be or statements. They so, are or statements. So so um, and one of the statements does not include intentionally or knowingly. And so if it's an or statement. It just has to be one of the uh, one of them mm -hmm. has to be correct. Mm -hmm. Is that logic sound? Correct, and you know I think the furnishing case that I believe council um, circulated if it's Commonwealth v. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so that was a case that didn't involve a licensee, so they weren't. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so so they were relying on that furnishing component, which required that, which had knowingly um, aspect yeah. to it. So that's why you do see that in the case. I mean, that's that's clear. It's clear from the statute. It's clear from the case law. But you know what we see from ABCC decisions at their hearing level and and review of ABCC decisions is that there's no knowing required. No knowledge is required when you're when you're selling to a minor. You know, we have the defenses laid out in Section 34B, and as counsel said, you know, they don't have to ask for identification, but they do so at their own peril. <coughs> and your thoughts? Um, I think it, um, in you know, we did hear from two different attorneys tonight a different interpretation, in, in fact, that were somewhat a polar opposite to each other. One, that there's um, that there's a specific intent requirement, and the other, that there's no scienter or intent at all requirement here. Um, but I think it makes sense for us to rely on the advice of town council, which I think looking at this is sound and looking at the the, the distinction um, between selling to and furnishing and that the, the case that um, you provide does seem to, to relate to furnishing um, and that having a, a different kind of knowledge requirement. Okay. Um, all right. Um, if I'm weighing in, I think an, uh, I think a violation occurred. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, so uh, I will now open it up to public comment. All right. That was easy. Uh, can we close the hearing? Move that the board close the hearing regarding. <coughs> excuse me. Try again. Move that the board close the hearing regarding Bay State Liquor's alleged violations. Okay. Second. Okay. Uh, in favor. 
So now, oh, it's been a long night. That's a lot of lawyer talk. All right. If I can parse. What was that? 1B1. 1B1. Yeah, okay. Um, so bear with me one moment. I just want to make sure what's at, what we're voting on here. All right. So now in front of us, we have two motions to determine whether violations occurred on the 18th and the. Uh, from the police, can you verify whether it was May 30th or May 31st? We have conflicting information. I just, I, I have, I've seen both dates, so I want to make sure we get it correct. Did it, are we looking at the date the violation occurred or when the report was filed? 31st. 31st, thank you. All right. All right, so what's going to happen now is we're going to have a motion. Um, we will have two separate motions, one for the 18th, one for the 31st. Once that determination is made on whether violations occurred on those two dates, we'll move into the penalty phase if there is one, if a violation is um, determined to have occurred. Mark, can I read the first one? Move that the board find that Bay State Liquors violated Mass General Law uh, C 138, Section 34, when it sold alcohol to a person less than 21 years of age on May 18th, 2019. Is there a second? Second. All right. So if you vote in favor of this motion, you are saying that a violation did occur on May 18th. Is there any further discussion? Okay. No? Okay. All those in favor? Okay. Motion carries. Uh, Mark, if you can read the second. Move that the board find that Bay State Liquors violated Master Law C 138, Section 34, when it sold alcohol to a person less than 21 years of age on May 31st, 2019. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? So if you vote in favor of this motion, we are saying that a violation did occur on May 31st. All those in favor? Motion carries. All right, now we move on to the penalty phase for these violations. Um, we have concluded that two violations have taken place. Uh, within our packet, there are guidelines for um, suspension. Uh, for those who aren't reading our lovely 180-page packet, uh, the guidelines as laid out are as follows. First offense, one to five day suspension. Second offense, six to 10 day suspension. Third offense, 10 to 30 days. Fourth offense, show cause hearing for license uh, revocation. revocation. Um, so these are guidelines. We are not held to them. Uh, it is worth noting that the state um, has, in, that our guidelines are more um, punitary than the state recommendations, um, which are around, I think, one to three for the first and four to six or so for the second. Is that correct, Avery? So I'm not aware of any formal state guidelines, So, but what we see from ABCC decisions is that the ABCC tends to uh, be a little bit more lenient than municipalities across the board, um, and even and more lenient than your policy um, establishes here. The ABCC especially tends to hold um, violations in abeyance. That's very common. You see that. Okay, we'll get to that. Yeah. All right. Um, so, as one point of clarification, we did find two violations from a penalty perspective. Are we required under the law to hold two separate penalties for these, or can we combine them? Um, well, I would advise that you vote a, a specific um, penalty with each vi associated with each violation. That will facilitate the appeal process if there if there is an appeal process. That doesn't mean you can't stack them, so you can have them be conse like consecutive. So if you have you know two days for the first violation and four days for the second, they could serve you know six consecutive days. Um, but I would I would advise separating them. Perfect. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so 
discussion on suggested penalties for the violations? I would suggest on the first violation, three days. Other thoughts? I have a slight concern um, that we should just talk through a little bit. I think our, our mission here is to be clear that this behavior is absolutely unacceptable, um, that it needs to be repaired, that it can't happen again. To me, these two violations occur kind of in rapid succession, and, and yes, they did happen, and it's two. Um, but I, I am mindful not to put this business owner uh, into a very tenuous position with the business at the same time. Mm -hmm. And we'll just be inclined to, um, you know, I think two or three days is probably appropriate on the first offense, and, and my gut is that may be appropriate on the, on the second. Um, I don't think we want to be putting you know, an owner's burden, you know, they could put this business owner out of business. That's not our intent. But it also is to be very clear that this is totally unacceptable. Other thoughts? Well, I, I want to make it very clear that we didn't put this business owner in any position. This business owner put himself in this position. Under discussion at the moment is the intended penalty, so I'd like to hear from all the board members before we proceed. Andy, and do you have thoughts? It is curious that we have two offenses at the same time. So the second offense, it's this isn't the second time they're coming before us. So it, it feels imposing a second offense penalty feels a little bit funny here because it's almost like we have two first offenses rather than a first offense and then a second offense because it's not as though they came before us, we imposed a penalty and then they re-offended mm -hmm. um, after mm -hmm. having heard from us. Um, so what would be your recommendation? Um, I'm, I'm wondering if we should look at imposing um, two um, penalties in the first offense space. Um, clarify what you mean by that. Um, you know, if we're, we're, we're supposed to do two separate penalties. We need one penalty for the first offense, if any, and one penalty for the second offense, mm -hmm. if any. And, but that we would use our guidelines on on first offense to, to look at both. So the one to five day for both. Oh, right, that's your recommendation, that we consider them both first offenses Effectively, as opposed to? Yes, yeah, but in, okay. the, in the penalty, in, in imposing the penalty, yes. Interesting, okay. And here, oh. I just have to go even further. How many days might you suggest? For each. I. You know, I, I, I agree with the values that Mark expressed in terms of sending a clear signal that this is not okay and also not wanting to put the business owner out of the business. I don't know what that number is. Um, and I, I think it would be helpful to... Um, do, you, do you have a sense of where that is? You know, how those values translate into a number? Do we have... Um, other than, you know, clearly severity goes up with more and more days that they're offline. Right. Um, and it strikes me that, that one day is not sufficient. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I kind of, kind of came up with the notion of two to three days. Mm -hmm. But in terms of, you know, I, I, I would hope that it's not so tenuous that a couple of days mm -hmm. completely puts them right. out of business. That, that would signify a different problem. And so my, my thought is, I, I, I hear what all of you have said, and um, good, good points. My question, I'd like to indicate um, our strong displeasure with this, uh, the, these violations, and, and um, give inappropriate consequence, if, if, if you will. Um, but I also want to make sure that 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 um, enforcement action sticks mm. uh, upon appeal. Um, I don't want to be wasting a lot of town, do town dollars in litigation uh, over this issue. So I guess I would turn to town council and ask you, mm -hmm. um, in your experience with the state, mm -hmm. uh, 
what sort of what are the number of days in a case like this where there were two violations, but they were within the same month, I believe. Um, and um, the, the, we were brought to it was brought to us all at once, and and then the uh, the licensee was n notified of all of this. What would this given those circumstances? Mm -hmm. um, what are the what what maybe some typical uh, penalties that would that have have borne up under the state? Under, under an appeal? Yeah, um, so um, two points to that. The first is it is typical that two offenses are brought um, to the to a licensing authority at one time. So, you know, maybe atypical here in Reading, but the ABCC does see multiple offenses in one proceeding fairly frequently. In terms of how many days, the ABCC will look to your policies. If you've established your policies through the proper process, which which you have, then they'll look at those to determine whether they're reasonable. You know, we adopted these policies believing that they were reasonable. We think that these are uh, defensible positions to be taking. Um, having said that, if there are no policies, what we typically see with an ABCC, uh, you know, at the ABCC, is that the first offense may be held in abeyance, and then the second offense would be served. So you would see something like two to five days held in abeyance for the first offense, and you know, three to seven days with some of those days maybe held in abeyance and some of those days to be served. But again, when you've established a policy that you have, the ABCC will defer to the local licensing authority. Um, so you should feel comfortable relying on what you have here. They are suggestions, so there's nothing wrong with uh, taking a different position as long as you're not arbitrary and you know go way above. But um, you know we feel confident that these are defensible. And, and what sort of what sort of conditions or extenuating circumstances, what sort of circumstances um, should the board take into account when assigning um, the severity of the penalty within the framework of our policy? That's really for the board to decide what we, you know, so I really want to leave that to your discretion. Um, I can give you some guidance what other communities look at. They look at, you know, what steps has the licensee taken since um, the, the fences have been brought to the attention of the board, um, how willingly and cooperatively was the licensee during the process. Um, uh, time periods between offenses, especially when um, they're separate hearings. Um, so, so, you know, it's, it's really, that's what we typically see, but there could be other things that this board finds relevant in making its decision, and I don't want to count that out. And it's, your, it's your discretion, it's your yeah. policy. So, Bob. Town Council can say whether I'm out of order here. But <laughs> I'm just to reflect on past discussions at this point and other hearings years ago, um, and discussions back and forth with the business owner. Not all days are the same. The amount of days is a factor, but the day of the week is mm -hmm. equally important. Mm -hmm. And yeah. a Tuesday, Wednesday versus a Friday, Saturday have significant mm -hmm. difference. So I just wanted to say that as past practice, that also was considered by the board, not just the number. That's a valid point as well. So I think, you know, I think a violation occurred. I do think we want to send a clear message to um, the community that we take this seriously, to Mark's point and Andy's. Um, I also think it is necessary, I also think we have an obligation to consider um, the efforts that the business owner has taken since this was raised. Um, namely, they have changed their policy, he has fired the individual um, who violated the law um, in serving to minors. Um, it was not it does not appear um, to be intentional in the sense of knowing he's a minor, or no, she is a minor. Um, they have, had they had carded the individual previously, they failed to do so in this instance, and I think that's where they got themselves into trouble. Um, they were, the licensee was very forthcoming in his testimony at our previous meeting, and I, and I think that should be considered in the number of days that we choose. Um, and the days of the week. So as far as days, number of days that we do for the first offense, um, I would suggest one or two um, 
possibly to be held in abeyance um, and for the second offense perhaps another two possibly three um, we can determine days of the week and whether or not they're held in abeyance so that it is no more than three to five days that's around the space I was thinking of I was not I was noticing in um, town council's letter that in 2013 the board suspended Meadow Brook Golf Club's license for two days for a first offense sale so two and two it comes up to four three to five so right. that's the space that's around the space that okay. feels right to me as well um, and, and, and what are your could I ask you what your thoughts are in putting some in a bay so um, for clarification, both of this board, mm -hmm. the many people we have in the audience tonight, mm -hmm. uh, and those at home, can you clarify what abeyance means right. um, and how we may implement it should we choose to? Right, so abeyance basically means that the licensee doesn't have to serve those times unless the licensee violates again during the period that that those uh, days will be held in abeyance. So you could, for example, hold two days in abeyance for two years. And if the licensee violates again in two years, he would serve those two days plus whatever uh, you know suspension yeah. would be imposed for the new violation. So it's a training type of uh, tool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. I might point out that you know we had a not exactly the same situation but a similar one where we had multiple violations and we sent a very loud and clear message and half of the over half of that message was upheld upon appeal with the balance held in abeyance which i thought made some sense i think you know i think that there has to be a clear message to this licensee and any others in this town that this is not acceptable behavior Mm -hmm. And I think that if you let them skate, that's a bad message. I think if you had three and five and you hold the first one in abeyance, you have a five-day suspension that has to be served now and a three-day suspension that needs to be held in abeyance for a period of 24 to 36 months. Now you've sent the message. Now there's a the message is that there are two violations and five days are being served. Three others never have to be served if this licensee does what they're supposed to do. And so that's that, that the first one, the three days, never really gets served. It just sits there. Um, but the second one at five sends a pretty clear message that this is not okay. Now, um, it, can it be Sunday through Thursday? I don't care. I mean, personally, but I do think that the number of days matters. Um, I, I really feel very strongly that you can use both tools, the abeyance and our policy, to send a clear message that is not that is painful but not onerous, um, and you know, and holds out a strong incentive to uphold their their licensee responsibilities to the law. Other thoughts on number of days and how they are held in abeyance, if at all. <coughs> I'd just like to check on something. Okay, this so I, I think that um, I think that the idea of the first violation uh, being held in abeyance makes really good sense. Okay. And that the second one be something reasonable but substantial enough that it sends a clear message. So to me, whether that's four or five days, I think that's probably the right, the right sort of area. And I would be you know, not uncomfortable with the three and five not suggest with the three in advance. Three and five seems um, overly punitive to me, given the efforts that the licensee has taken. Um, to correct the behavior and actions going forward. Um, the message is clearly already received. Um, that said, a violation did in fact occur. So I would be inclined on more on the order of two days held in abeyance for the first offense and two to three for the second offense. Four to five seems what? Well, it's a family-owned business. So, um, 
to put this in perspective with tobacco, mm -hmm. uh, which which <laughs> which is much more dangerous to human health than alcohol, um, as the numbers show, and this CDC numbers also show. The first offense for that, and the, the Board of Health regulations, is a hundred dollar fine. So, so um, there seems to be a disproportionate response um, to alcohol violations than to tobacco violations. That that colors my thinking on this. Um, that's an interesting comparison. I'm sorry. So that's an interesting comparison. Yeah. Um, so mm. uh, with that, I would say two days uh, in abeyance, two days to be served, and then um, uh, oh, I think that's what you suggested, is it? Mm -hmm. Um, and um, and and then um, yeah, I guess. Okay. Anne, your thoughts? You're the only one who hasn't weighed in on numbers. Um, so I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> what if we did um, two days for the first, and then? Could we get a majority for three to three to four? I guess I'm hearing five and two. Sure. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I would be fine with two in abeyance for the first, three for the second, uh, if we determine the days of the week to be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, which are presumably the least impactful. I, I mean, I would assume from the perspective of the licensee that for, for their the viability of their business, less is preferable for them, mm -hmm. clearly. But I, is, could we hear what, what, in a, what the actual impact of a, a day, um, oh, what, what, what would be the actual impact? the business and maybe I, at this point I can let my <coughs> client address it I don't know if you're asking financially or otherwise but I can tell you that it, in my experience and I think probably you will share the same experience you go to a store it's closed and you're wondering why it's closed and it's closed the next day and you wonder why it's closed the next day maybe you go to a different store and you don't go back to that store so it could actually have a, a lasting effect um, but um, we I would like to ask my client and I would also again um, reiterate what you had mentioned earlier that um, I think the purposes of a second offense because it's an enhanced penalty and the way the law applies it whether it's an administrative hearing or in, in the courts the purpose of an enhanced penalty is because you've been given a chance and you and you violated it so I would agree um, with the thinking that this should be treated as one offense um, or if it's treated as two offenses perhaps um, a warning on the first offense and a fine on the uh, on the on the second. But again, he he did not have a chance to um, correct this problem. Um, he didn't even know about that first time. And as you said, it wasn't intentional. He did card this, this person. I don't want to beat a dead horse, but um, to impose an enhanced penalty when he didn't have the chance. To, I believe that's what is intended um, by this. Um, and, and I think it, enhancing the penalty is not appropriate in this case. But as my client, um, the impact uh, that a closure would have on your, your business um, financially and, and otherwise. So I, I think in the short term, I mean, the way I think about it is like a break even point. So 365 days in a year, Really, uh, you know, for a lot of businesses, really a profit is only being made on the 30 days of the full year because the rest of it is to cover costs. Um, so that's one thing in the short term. In the long term, we are going to lose customers because ultimately it's a habit. People who are in this area will come into our store and if they decide, they're, oh, this, this store is not, it's not open, let's go somewhere else. And, and that does put a strain also, you know, if our business, if it does fall, we are also in the same unit as a natural food exchange as well, um, and, and, and along with other businesses, and, and we are the flagship for the whole, for the whole unit. Uh, so, you know, we do not, um, obviously, we would like, it, 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 like a smaller penalty, uh, if possible. 
Okay, thank you. Sorry, I just wanted to make one point <coughs> about if we're closed and they don't know why we're closed. Your policies do require the a notice be posted yes. in the window specifying mm -hmm. the reason for the closure. They will know. Just yeah. wanted to make that clear. <coughs> Quick, I, I think that um, this notion of abeyance um, and having that as kind of an additional incentive, I think, is a really good one. I think mm -hmm. it actually makes the point stronger than, than anything else we can really do. So I think that the, if we're going to do something in the first, the 18th violation, I think having that you know, with an abeyance period makes very, very good sense. Mm -hmm. And it, it becomes much stronger if there were to be another offense in the future, which I hope there's not. Right. Um, on the second one, um, I'm, you know, the notion of, of just a day or two seems a bit uncomfortable to me. I don't think that that is kind of responding to the situation. Um, I think it's got to be a bit stronger. But to Anne's point, if it's something, you know, if it's probably three days, three to four days, I think is probably right. Um, they would not be held in advance. That, that would be intent to serve. I'd be fine with three. Four seems, I mean, to the point made earlier, that we are reviewing them separately, but the owner only knew of them once. It does feel to me like effectively a first offense has been brought to us, and that is the one to five day. So if we did the first as two, and the uh, first as two to be held in abeyance, and the second as three, that feels that feels like the right space. Okay. So are we comfortable with two days in abeyance for the first offense and three days to be served? For the second offense. I'm okay with that. Are you asking me? No, I'm not comfortable with that at all. I think that sends a very bad message. I think that it doesn't. We did not put this licensee in this position. He put himself in this position. And I think it's our obligation to our citizens to send a clear message here. And I think that we're dancing around it. And we should be sending a clearer message than two and two or two and three, particularly since there's an abeyance opportunity with the first one. So I disagree with that. OK. I, I think. Um, Andy and then Bob. Yeah. Uh, just quickly, we also have to, I mean, part of the penalty is the fact that we've had, he's had to hire a lawyer and pay that lawyer to come here for two meetings. That is, uh, in essence, penalizing him as well. No? He will pay that lawyer again when he appeals. That's not our okay. problem. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to time us out here. Bob, you had a comment? Just a question for town council. Does it make any legal difference which one is held in advance, first or second? Um, I, no, you could serve the first offense and okay. hold the second in advance. Okay. Um, I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. All right. So, okay. if you're start off. I was just going to say the rationale typically tends to be that you know the first offense is not like something that was the first time they ever did it, so we'll be a little bit more lenient, and then the second offense tends to be more punitive. So, okay. Um, so, are we comfortable with two days in advance for the first offense and three days to be served for the second offense? Uh, I am. Andy, Mark. Yes. Okay. And. <coughs> John, we no. are now. Okay. Yeah, uh, talk about the days. I'm sorry. Okay, no, that's fine. Uh, the days. Um, I would be inclined uh, for uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I would say. How much leeway do we have on the timing of the days? You can specify them whatever days you want. Yeah. Um, and, but one more point is, uh, you do need to specify how long the days will be held in abeyance as well. Mm -hmm. So make sure that that's part of your right. decision. But yeah, you could do. Saturday, Sunday, Monday, I mean, as Bob said, you can do them whatever days yeah. you are, want. Are there other thoughts on which three days? Well, the thought I had was um, do them on days that kids don't have to get up and go to school the next day. Friday. You know, they could be vacation days. They, you know, they could be, um, you know, Friday, Friday or Saturday. Um, or, yeah, or a vacation day. And they don't have to be consecutive. We have seen boards that have done five Saturdays in a row, so it, mm -hmm. it is within your discretion to adopt a policy of a suspension that you feel is appropriate. I'm inclined to rip the Band-Aid off and just do the three days consecutively. If we held it longer in advance, John, would that make you more 
the days are to me the days are sending are the message the abeyance is you know a powerful tool to I mean you, you put three days in abeyance and they never have to be served never I mean I'm sure that this gentleman never wants to be here again for this I'm certain of that um, I think he opened his business in good faith but there's a there's a cost to doing business when you don't run it correctly and that's what this is the opportunity for the abeyance on the first offense I think is is powerful for both both parties included one to us because it sends a message that like please don't do this again because it's going to be very costly and for the licensee it's dodging a bullet that doesn't have to be served ever um, and I think that that's powerful um, I realize that this kind of is a first offense thing but it's two first offenses our policy says you can for each one do one to five days that's why I come up with the five days on the second one I mean right, serve your time that's John, so that's where I'm at. We've, we've rehashed this the majority of the board is comfortable with the two day and ask me a question and I gave so her I was an answer if we did a three day a, excuse me a three year <laughs> advance versus a two year advance so that would kind of so like you're on notice for longer for a, long a longer period of time um, I'd be fine with a two-year abeyance I was suggesting three. Oh, three. in terms of sending a strong you know the sending a stronger message um, there's a question from the public all out Stephen Crook 137 Pleasant Street um, I would I would first argue that two violations have occurred about two weeks apart um, to the first, to the first, I would suggest, if my memory serves me, and it may not, historically, and historically by over the last 20 years or so, this board has tended to dole out three days. First, we think that is correct. I would submit three days as two more health advance for the first. With respect to the timing of the serving of it, if it occurred hypothetically, say, on a weekday, I would say serve them over a weekday. If it's occurred across the weekend, they get served over a weekend. So it's a dissimilar time period. Second offense, though, I would suggest that you look at the 10 days in your policy for second second offenses. Now, you may decide to hold several of those days in abeyance. But I would submit 10 days would not be unreasonable. Now, you might want to divide them and say, well, two events occurred several weeks apart. We'll, we'll make them serve the two of them several weeks apart so there's a window in between. Um, in the interest of protecting the, the long-term viability of, of the organization. By the time we get to third offenses, and you may recall a years ago, we had a case where a second and a third offense occurred in about 15 minutes of each other. If that, the violator ended up serving 50 days, that's five zero. That is good. Four zero, 40 days, more held in abeyance. Upheld by the state board. Upheld by the state board. I, I mean, I understand occasionally mistake about the, the fact that two occurred within, within a couple of weeks of each other, but at that time, the insufficient attention was being paid to avoiding this kind of thing. It was not a, a mere accident. And I think we want to send a strong message that we will not tolerate this, particularly where there's a second violation to occur. Now, if the owner cleans up his act and stays clean over the course of the next couple of years or three years that you hold this thing in abeyance, you never have to serve the rest of that time. But I, I think you need to send a strong message. So I would again submit perhaps the first one five days, three serve, two in abeyance, the second one ten days, and at a minimum, I would suggest seven days served in the three health abeyance. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We still have to decide on these. So, um, to Andy's point about not um, days when kids aren't going, that should we do like a, a school vacation week or something like that? That's sort of what I was thinking. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I should know this. Well, we should be no February, right? Yeah, February. 
They have, yeah, yeah, they have. A, there's one in December. And I think there's one around Thanksgiving as well, and and that's one where many families, teenagers, stay home mm -hmm. for the Thanksgiving dinner, and then. Um, it's also the time that adults buy the most alcohol. It is. Um, it is true. I. I yeah. We could it's, do a February vacation, um, so as not to hit the holidays. Mm -hmm. which I imagine is a time of heavy purchase. Um, so to clarify, are we comfortable with the two and the three days? Is that what we're going with as a majority before we move forward on the exact timing of it? The two held in a base. Two held in a base for the first offense, three for the second offense to be served. Can we do three three years for the for held the in a base? Yeah. I mean, that seems long to me, but I'm open. Well, gets the attention. Uh, okay, we'll go, we'll go with three years. In terms of sending the message that, you know. That's fine. Yeah. All right, so we'll go with. businesses as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Um. We'll keep an eye on you for longer. All right, so we're in agreement on that. Three years for to be held in abeyance. Two days to be held in abeyance for three years. Uh, as far as the timing of the three days that will be served. I think waiting until February vacation is kind of long. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe back here, rip the Band-Aid off and do... Uh, Second week. I mean, is there a recommended timing as far as um, should he choose to appeal? Right, so he has five days to appeal. It's a very short appeal mm -hmm. period under the statute. Um, so communities hand or licensing authorities handle this differently. Some just make it effective on the receipt of the notice, which could go out tomorrow, for example. Um, and then if the licensee chooses, they can go to court to try to get a preliminary injunction to stay those days when, while they appeal. The second option is the board uh, builds into their vote an appeal period, so they'll say they're effective within six days of receipt of the notice unless um, an appeal is filed at which they shall be served upon um, further action by this board because what ends up happening with appeals is it goes to the ABCC and then they send it back um, to the board. So there's sort of two options. One is effective immediately. The other one is effective after six days or a date, a date in the future. Why don't we go with a date in the future? Um, I'm just looking at the calendar. Because uh, just in response to some of the public comment, I just wanted to um, draw folks' at attention to what uh, town council included in the letter to us, which is in the select board packet. The examples that were provided to us as a board as to what the select board has done in the past included the 2013 board suspension for two days for a first offense sale. Um, and then in 2014, the board apparently opposed a 90-day suspension um, for a second and third offense sale that was um, disapproved by the ABCC, finding the penalty be to, be to be unreasonable and instead recommended the licensee serve 50 days with 40 days to be held in abeyance for two years. So that's what the board has before us in terms of what what the select board's um, done historically. But that doesn't go into when it's to be served. Correct. Right, so with Ricky's Liquor, which was the second and third offense, mm -hmm. those were effective immediately, and okay. the licensee went to court to try to get a stay on that, mm -hmm. and they were unsuccessful. Ricky's Liquor is a, a little bit different than the situation presented here. They had a violation. Um, while the board was holding that hearing, the second and third offense occurred. So within, oh, a wow. month, um, within a month period, all three offenses had occurred. Wow. Um, and okay. Dirty. That's just that's some helpful. additional background. That's helpful. All right, so that's, that's definitely different than what we're dealing with now. Yes. All right. Um, it is now August 27th. Might I recommend that the three days be served September 23rd, 24th, and 25th? It's a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So I'm going to suggest I'm that we don't use a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday because those are the probably the three quietest days of the week, and I don't think that's the right message. Okay. Why wouldn't we just do it immediately? It gets delayed if he appeals. Okay, good. Let him appeal. That's what he wants to do. If he doesn't, if he wins, then, you know, it happens according to the way that ABCC finds. If he doesn't, he starts the suspension. Thoughts? 
That's uh, just fine. With, uh, yeah, I, 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 I agree with John. Okay. So, so Jari, just to clarify, if, if it's effective upon the notice, immediately upon the notice, so tomorrow or the next day, yeah. uh, if he chooses to appeal, he would have to go to court to get the stay. Yeah. So it would mean an immediate action on his behalf to go to court. Um, we would obviously have to go to court to defend that. Um, and then the appeal would happen at a later date. Um, the that's ABCC not, takes up. Let's not it's incur not, more litigation sort of more legal fees here. If we do it for a set date in the future, regardless of what those dates may be, we spare ourselves our town council's court appearance. Is it, is it so? That's likely so, yes. I see. So That's good I, to know. Bob. Bob. Uh, just for town council, if, um, if we serve the owner tomorrow, when does it start? The next day? Whatever date is um, voted on by the board. So I think that's what they're discussing now. If you serve them tomorrow and the board votes to establish the, the um, suspension at the end of September, then he just has notice tomorrow that he has to but turn it's in. To, if it's just to be served as soon as possible and, and we deliver tomorrow, does it start the next day? Because they have to come in and bring their license to right. us. Exactly. And we have to be open for that to happen. And there's a long weekend coming up. Oh, so. I see what you're saying. I see. Oh, they can bring it to the police department. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so if you would prefer to go with a weekend, might I suggest uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the last weekend in September? Is that, um, is everyone amenable to that? Yeah, okay. that sounds fine with me. Great. So, from a motion perspective, now comes the fun part. So uh, the one question is, do we say immediate or I would based on what we just said, let's postpone. I would say postpone it to a set date. Because otherwise okay. we'll stay with this whole okay. How's the draft motion? All right. I think I can do it. So um, I do the first one we're going with a two day to be held in abeyance for three years. Um, I mean, not okay. I want to commence the first one. Say that again. The, 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 uh, the language is so it's the first to commence one immediately or upon receipt of notice of decision or such other day as the board may desire on the first offense. That's going to be in advance. Do you serve commencing immediately? Uh, com so I would say so commence commencing September 20. Sixth. Is it date for both? Yes. Okay. I think I can do it. Okay. Let's try it. That's September twenty sixth. You said September twenty sixth. It is a Thursday. And these are the two that are going to be held in abeyance. Yes. That's the first one. Okay. That's, yeah. That's why. Right. You've got two sets of dates conflicting with each other. Have each of them be the same date to start or overlap? Yeah, um, yeah you can because these okay. are being held in abeyance. Yeah, okay. exactly. So the only other question so the way that the motion is drafted here is that it gives them the opportunity if they appeal, then everything stayed until the termination of that appeal. It's up to the board whether they want to include that language or not. So if the board wants to include it, you would include the part that's identified as subpart B in your motion. If you don't want to uh, give them that opportunity, you can just end it at the end of subpart A. Um, repeat that part as far as part B is concerned for yes. me. So the way that this was drafted was if the licensee decides to appeal, that it would have an automatic stay of the suspension until the ABCC has held the hearing and referred the matter back to the board and the board issues its final decision. With abeyances, that would mean if the licensee was to violate again while this was being appealed and stayed, that um, it wouldn't necessarily count. Um, as they wouldn't automatically trigger the service of those days that are held in abeyance. You'd have to wait until the ABCC appeal has been turned. Oh, I see. I see. 
but I thought that if we did it to a date in the future, mm -hmm. both the abeyance and the, the actual days, yeah. that would reduce the likelihood of us incurring um, more legal, legal costs. It would, because we would know, if you do it a date in the future, we would know whether he's appealing, yeah. and if he makes a request of the board, he can come back to the board and ask that you stay it, um, instead of having to immediately <coughs> run to court uh, tomorrow or Monday to get an, um, okay. an emergency stay. So, so B gives us more flexibility? It does. All right, so I would be inclined to include Section B as part of the motion. Thoughts? Objections? No? Okay. So, Mark, then we have, so we're reading the first one here. It's two-day suspension held at abeyance for three years, commencing September 26th, and we are reading Part B. One set of words, and. Yes. No, it should, it should, oh, be, it should be or. It okay. should be or? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, because okay, is he, if he appeals, okay. A gets held. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's All try right. the first motion. <laughs> All right. Move that the board impose a two-day suspension to be held in abeyance for three years for the violation on May 18th to be served uh, commencing on September 26th, 2019, or if this decision is appealed to the Alcoholic Beverages Control Commission upon issuance of any further order from the Select Board. Is there a second? Second. Awesome. Great. So, if you're in favor, we are, you are supporting the two days in uh, the two-day suspension to be held in abeyance for three years and the three-day suspension to commence September 26th, pending any appeals. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, well, well, the second motion. Oh, damn. So <laughs> <laughs> okay, move that the board impose a three-day suspension for the violation on May 31st, 2019, to be served commencing on September 26th, 2019. Or if this decision is appealed to the Alcoholic Beverages <coughs> Control Commission upon the issuance of any further order from the Select Board. Is that right? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Is there a second? I'll second that. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay. Motion carries. We have already voted on the select for policy. This matter is now closed. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, board members. All right, let's take a five minute recess before we commence <coughs> with the next agenda item.
session. <laughs> So, um, before we move on to the next one, we have numerous items still remaining on our agenda. Bob, I wanted to um, confirm with you the priority of these that we have in front of us. We have Austin Prep, the monitoring agent, previewing the warrant for November town meeting, the ad hoc restructuring, and the gas leak petition. Um, and then we have executive session. So, of those, I assume that the Austin prep and the monitoring agent are necessary to accomplish tonight, given the audience that we have recently right. I acquired. Would, I would assume the monitoring agent is only going to take two minutes of your time, and right. Austin prep a little bit more. Okay. Um, previewing the warrant, you're scheduled to vote on it on your next meeting to close it, so I suggest you preview it, whether you want to be satisfied with what you saw in the packet or hear from me. Um, it's up. In your estimation? No. <laughs> Not from us. And I think that if the board agrees with our solution, uh, it'll be a quick vote. Okay, so let's open that and see if we can close that one quickly. If not, um, we'll perhaps set that aside. I would like to touch on the gas leak one. Um, that should hopefully be a quick one as well. All right, so let's, uh, so, so, uh, so we have to stands. hit everything. All right, as long as we're all on the same page. Let's speak but they're all quick, John. Okay. Yeah. 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 They've all been quick so far, so. Right, very efficient. Every reason to believe they'll be quick going forward. All right, Bob, uh, over to you for Austin Prep. Um, thank you. Um, I'll soon introduce uh, Headmaster Jim Hickey. Uh, Jim's been here for about six years. Uh, one of the first things he did when he came to town was, was pay me a visit and say he wanted to be a good neighbor, and I really appreciated that because he wasn't asking for anything. Uh, and that relationship has continued. Um, Austin Prep has been um, what we called years ago with Select Board Goals a really good community partner. Um, they've helped us in many ways. We had a problem at Barrow School. We were allowed to bring all the Barrow. Um, we had a, an active shooter drill. And I tell you that I really appreciate the relationship that's built up. In front of you today is a request, but it's also a mutual benefit. Prep uh, is undertaking what I call a three-phase football field is completed. The second one has uh, gone through a process this summer through CPDC. They're approved and uh, CONSCOM could potentially approve it uh, at their next meeting, not to say that I know what they will do. Um, and that in, in the process of going through the second phase, we identified what is really a mutual opportunity to have them have a better project in CONSCOM eyes and have us fix some stormwater problems that we identified as our worst in town. So uh, Willow um, floods occasionally and we have to close it and that's kind of a bad street to close because there's no easy cut through somewhere else that's nearby. Mm -hmm. um, so when we realized we had the opportunity, uh, you know, we were very, very interested and have had a discussion since uh, I believe it's March. <coughs> Um, what's in front of the board uh, for approval is a uh, draft memo of understanding. The work involved in this project is technical and complex, and the path forward on it is still not 100% certain. But the memo itself is actually quite simple. Um, if you will, it'll, and certainly council can, can add to this, it allows the town to work on private property. Um, there's two potential areas that we want to work on. One is it, what is described uh, as an undersized culvert, which is near the field they're proposing to work on. And then the other is drainage ditches, some of which is on Austin Prep's land and some of it is on our land. Um, but we need to get permission from the board to be on that land to be doing work. And that's what this agreement, in a, in a sense, in its essence does. Um, so at that point, I'd like to turn it over to the headmaster, uh, Jim Hickey, who just wants to walk you through his project. Uh, Bob, very, before very we briefly. take that step, I have a question as far as the yeah. private land. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned part of it is Austin Prep and part of it is the town. Uh, is that for both sections that you were referring to? Um, the both sections is only for drainage ditches. The culvert itself is only on Austin Prep land. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I, I've read the the um, the, the, the well, when I've gone through the plan, and um, and I and I don't necessarily need nothing against you, but the, given the late hour, I don't need to hear a presentation on the um, on the project to, to approve uh, okay. work on private land. I mean, what's the downside? Is there liability or something like that that we incur, right? Um, well, you, under this agreement, you have um, 
uh, you were being given permission to work on on private land. Yeah. Um, the uh, the whole the the potential municipal liability as a result of something going wrong with this project probably doesn't depend on whether it happened on public land or private land. If you if you cause damage downstream, it's it's not going to it's not going to matter whether what you did happened on or off. So right. really, I don't think that that's relevant to your consideration. It's just that you want to make sure that you have in place an agreement so that when you go on private land, you're not trespassing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, Vanessa. I was just going to give no, the time that we have left. It's only still. It's only four thirty. But uh, <laughs> I think. Yeah. I think it's an excellent trick. observation. Thank Missable you, Andy. Trick. So, uh, Bob, are you as town manager comfortable with this agreement? Yes. I, there was a memo from Ryan as well. Right. Yes, we are. There's a mutual agreement. Everyone's on board. Yep. Okay, so a couple quick questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in the agreement, uh, two, well, two questions. One is how much of, what is the town planning to be putting into the project? So far, uh, the town has put in uh, ten to $15,000 to do some study work up front. Um, there's an additional potential of 50000 in the stormwater enterprise fund as drainage money. Um, beyond that, we would have to ask someone for money. So, if you will, the sh and, and by the way, the work is not imminent. Um, we don't know when it's going to be, but it doesn't have to be in the next few months. That's a different part of their project. Mm -hmm. So, this could be a couple years um, as mm -hmm. a process. Um, I'm imagining that it's possible that we will go to a town meeting and ask for a bigger amount of money if we determine that it's a bigger problem, not just on Austin prep land. Um, otherwise, we'd be limited by the 50000 So one way or the other, the town meeting would be involved. Okay. And the amount that uh, Austin Prep is suggesting in here, I think, is $75,000 between permits and, and a few other activities? Um, that would be um, for materials and for labor um, for what we do. That they, would, they, could, they may effectively pay back up to that amount. <clears throat> Got it. Okay, and you're, you're at this point, from what we know, yeah, I'm comfortable that the seven five would take care of the culprit. Certainly, thank you. Yeah. Um, in reviewing the do the document extensively, I, it's kind of a win around the table. I mean, the, yeah. the, you know, the the town finds itself the agreement itself just gives the town permission, but the if you think about it in a holistic way. Um, it's a real opportunity to partner with a, with a private enterprise here. It happens to be an educational enterprise, and you know they improve their offering to, to their students, um, and we have the opportunity to really help the neighborhood in a big way. That yeah. that particular Willow Street area, when it when it goes bad, it's awful, and yeah. you know the mm -hmm. idea that this you know. This kind of collaboration, I just think we need to move on it and hope they get going soon. <laughs> so, okay. I'm in agreement, and especially given the time, um, I'm comfortable moving forward with the motion <coughs> to approve the memo of understanding between town and Austin Prep, unless there are any questions for town council or the headmaster or Bob. Um, very small point, I just noticed in the draft MOU. Um, Oh, it lists only one of my two middle initials, so we may want to have DJ. That's all. <laughs> Since that's my name on that's my name on the voter rolls too. So okay. to keep it all and consistent. DJ Landry. Yes. Okay. Spin those records, DJ. Can I can do the motion as it. Please read the okay. motion. So move to approve the memo of understanding between the town and Austin Preparatory School as amended with Anne's. <laughs> Is there a second? Second. All those in favor. Thank you. Um, we're going to ask the board to sign three copies and also the headmaster. Uh, Caitlin, you can just hand write in the other initials. <laughs> okay. I can also do that. Caitlin, okay. if you'd okay. like. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you. Excellent presentation. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it really, I mean, I've been to it. It is an excellent presentation. I, I, I hope, I hope you don't come. You should at least put the photo up while we're signing it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's <laughs> a great idea. <laughs>
I didn't need to steal your thunder. <laughs> uh, it's really a steal away. Yeah, sorry. Exactly the right words. Good thing. All right. So while we are signing, we will move on to the next agenda item, which is we are voting to approve a monitoring agent for 475 Main Street, forty R project. Mm -hmm. uh, Bob is there. Further explanation. Um, this is the third public. one you've been asked to do in the last few months. Um, it's it's fairly routine. This is an agent who works in town already, and you saw a memo from Julie Mercier um, saying the support very much, uh, uh, staff very much supports this. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I have no concerns. Uh, so. Okay, uh, so there is a motion. Yeah, a, any discussion? Um, any discussion? Do we get a second to that motion? We have I a motion, motion yet. Oh, okay. Just didn't know if there was any questions. I think we covered this at our last meeting when we appointed an agent to one of the other projects. It's we did. Yeah. pretty standard. Okay. All right, so uh, Mark, can you read the motion? Move to approve Metro West Collaborative Development, Inc. as the affordable housing monitoring agent for the 40R project at 475, formerly known as 467 Main Street. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Yep. Motion carries. All right. Thank you very much, guys. Yep. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Thank gentlemen. You. Project is really looking good. Thank you very much. Yep. We're uh, excited to get it open. How soon? Uh, we're going to end of February. That'd be fantastic. Any uh, tenants or projects? Yeah. Uh, we're looking around right now. We're just starting a marketing campaign. But, uh, Great. Thank you very much. Good night. All right. Next up, we will be previewing the warrant for November town meeting. <laughs> Bob, Ready? back to you. Okay. Uh, first yes. three uh, articles are conventional by charter. Um, I do want to mention that the uh, RMLD, uh, is she general manager, I guess, it's late, um, requested, and we've not yet confirmed with the uh, the moderator that she'd like to change to April just because they changed their fiscal year and she'll have full financials in April to reflect on. She would not have them in November. Um, let's see. The fourth article is also a tradition. Uh, current year uh, budget changes. There, there are many. Um, I'll go over those on September 11th. Uh, there is at least one prior year bill. Um, I'm not sure yet if we have surplus materials because the policy recently changed. We definitely have surplus materials. I don't know if they meet the hurdle of town meeting action, so that's uh, tentative. Uh, another tentative one, I don't think this will happen, but we thought it was good to have the article on um, for a lot of the 40-R projects. There are state payments. In case by November we get one of those payments, this would allow us to move it right into the stabilization fund. Um, we have done it in the past years after the fiscal year closed, so it's not essential that we catch it quickly, but it seems like a good planning tool. Uh, there are a couple of debt um, rescissions to make, um, notably the uh, 900,000 that remain on um, the uh, Birch Meadow uh, field lighting. Speak up a little bit. Uh, Sorry, Bill. Um, retirement board has. <laughs> we all are, Bill. <laughs> Retirement Board has asked uh, to bring this article back. They had it a couple of years ago. They deferred it because of our override uh, situation. Uh, they want to increase the uh, COLA for the uh, retirement uh, situation. Uh, I will show the Board that even without this uh, retirement pension costs next year are going to go up at least 20%, possibly 25 With if this passes. It's not an insignificant amount. It's eight or $900,000, but I think we've got it handled within the uh, budget for FY21. Um, because the town recently had to hire itself an affordable uh, housing monitoring agent because it was not at the start of one of these projects but rather in the middle or, or well after and sadly the prior one had passed away um, we could only procure the services of someone for three years and found it was not particularly advantageous for getting a lot of applicants so this would allow uh, this to happen um, for longer than three years uh, similar <coughs> In a similar vein, DPW, um, over the next uh, six months, will need to go out and bid for a rubbish disposal contract. Um, the market right now is either five or ten year contracts. Ten is not easy, uh, but we'd like permission for greater than three years, and we'll probably ask for ten years. And then we've done that in the past, and it's been very successful. Bob, didn't we just do this a year or two? Um, there's two components. One is uh, recycling, and one is rubbish. So it's it's two different parts, that. right? They don't they're not coincidental. Um, you're, you're well aware of the senior tax uh, relief home rule petition. 
Um, CPDC has four zoning amendments, which I'll skip right over happily. And there's a petitioned article from possibly someone in this room and others to rename a softball field in the Birch Meadow Complex. Um, that's the warrant. It's two or three nights, and then the board can decide later whether there's a separate article on the natural gas leaks or whether it is contained within one of the other budget articles. So, um, you know, the, the home rule petition for new town meeting members might take some time. The four zoning ones will probably take some time. I think the rest is fairly straightforward. Can anything be added to this? Certainly. And Absolutely. What's the kind of the deadline around well, that? I've, I've asked you to close it on the 10th. Um, technically, your deadline is the 24th, but again, I'd like to try to do it in meeting before. One of the things we've talked about here, and I thought that we might see it um, in, in front of town meeting, is a discussion about um, um, a, a beer and wine license, adding some beer and wine licenses for our convenience stores. I realize that in order to be able to do that, we're going to need to, you know, cross the uh, inevitable shadow of Beacon Hill. Um, but, you know, um, it seems to me that, you know, some kind of a straw um, warrant, if town meeting is not going to be amenable to this, then why would we you know, pull in a chit and go to our state reps and ask them to help us, you know, yeah. structure something for, you know, go through the House and the Senate. It just struck me that it would make more sense, I, and I could be way off about this, and I, I just don't know the, the right protocol for it, but if, if we put something out for a town meeting to say this is a great idea or this is a stupid idea, we'll never vote for it, it it'll tell us where to go next. Uh, you Either know, just let it go or... The non-legal answer is I would suppose an instructional motion might get you that information informally. Um, to have anything more formal, you know, I assume you'd have to do a home rule petition ultimately. I'm not sure what early... I don't step. know the order is what I'm... Yeah, I'm, I figured since I normally it would go through this board, <coughs> go through a public hearing process, uh, and then go to town council as a request for a home rule petition language for an article. That's right. about right. Right. Um, it's late to do that <coughs> for November town meeting. Okay. Yeah. In the past. I'm just trying. Right. Right. I, you know, it chat. was one of those things that we have not got back onto our agenda. Okay. Right. Because we've had a very full agenda, and yeah, I don't I mean, know how it's going to sort out. But last time we did this, we did it as a special town meeting, which is always a tool that's available, which allows you a much shorter window before town meeting where you have to do these things instead of now. Right. Um, so it, it's it's still possible to do it in November. It's a question of whether you want to get a sense of town meeting before you go through the whole formal process or not. And I really think the best way is an instructional motion to get the informal sense of a town meeting. But what I don't know is will town meeting have enough in an instructional motion to understand what you're asking? Yeah, that's I worry about that. Yeah, you know I think it needs a real presentation. Yeah, you know. And, and let it let the chips fall where they may. I, I don't right. know where so they're going to fall. So, John, I'm happy to put that on a future agenda for us to discuss. If the instructional <coughs> motion seems like it won't provide enough information to town meeting uh, for November, and we're already sort of pressed for time as far as when we have to close the warrant, what we can do is discuss it amongst ourselves, ask essentially Bob to do a presentation on it, or you can do one yourself if you're so inclined, um, and table that for April town meeting. All right. Does that sound good? I just, yeah, I just don't want it to get lost in the shuffle. I, mm -hmm. you know, it just struck me that. Okay. I'd be very supportive of that too. I think that this board really should have a good hard discussion about that <coughs> first before we kind of move I'm, I'm okay step. with that. I just, you know, I want to get it front and center. Yeah, so yeah I'm just, I'm looking at the list of things that, that we need to bring kind of back. That's the correspondence. So, so, so Bob, can right? we add that to our yep. list of future agendas? Okay. And one other thing the board has uh, discussed and will discuss at your next meeting was um, local roads and the mass dock. Whether yeah. you go through a home mm -hmm. petition yep. for that, so we'll discuss that next mm -hmm. time. So, anything else on the warrant? No. Nope. Great. Any other questions from the board regarding the warrant? Uh, that's coming up. Okay.
Uh, so moving on to the oh, so we're not voting on anything yet, correct, Bob? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. This was a preview. For just this preview. was just a preview. Okay. Right. Yeah. So next up, we have a vote to restructure the ad hoc committee for human rights. So I will hand it off to Andy and Ann. Yeah. So so Ann and I talked about this previously today. Um, a very quick overview, which we're all familiar with, familiar with already. Um, in March, when we appointed members to the ad hoc committee, um, some were non-residents, um, two were non-residents, and that was in violation of the charter. <laughs> and I were trying to deal with that. We came up with door A and door B, and, and you asked for a door C. Um, I subsequently um, rethought my door and, and uh, clo you know, closed it myself. So, um, but fortunately, someone in the in the ad hoc committee, I won't mention her name because I haven't asked for, for her permission, but she had this excellent idea of uh, just establishing an ad hoc uh, that consisted of five members, um, two from the select board, two from the school committee, and one from the board of library, uh, the board of library trustees. And that the people who are currently already participating in this ad hoc would, uh, would you know, they've committed to still show up, still help us out, still provide ideas. So it's really, um, and it would, and, and they all love this idea. Um, and and so the, if, if we could, we'd also There's make it in a quorum much easier. So if I could just read the, it's a sh very short um, change of enabling language. And if the board likes it, could we, could we vote on it tonight? And then uh, we'd be able to get going with. Uh, so John, you missed the, um, I know you stepped out. Um, the I, I've read this. Did you do more than what's on the screen right now? No, just no. a recommendation for the change. Okay. All right, great. Do you want to read it? Um, just the, the top. just yeah. to highlight a couple of their changes oh, in addition to the membership. We earlier mentioned the change in the in the sunset mm -hmm. date um, to accommodate mm -hmm. a um, the possibility of bringing this before April town no, meeting. Um, and then the other pieces we do we do in the language change the mission um, so that it's a human rights focused organization rather than a human rights board just to provide a little bit of flexibility as to what that will look like um, and uh, removes the language that says that the ad hoc committee would consider the recommendations made to the select board at the stakeholders meeting um, there was a feeling on among some members of the ad hoc that that was those recommendations really should be considered by the select board rather than having it go to the ad hoc so Okay. And it also feels like the work of the ad hoc in, in thinking through this human rights focused organization is 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 full. There's a lot of work to be done just on that. So, okay. uh, so Andy, do you want to go ahead and read it? And if we're all in agreement, we can vote. Yes. Um, in ad an ad hoc committee is hereby created to help establish a human rights focused organization. The following representatives shall be invited to participate as members in this. Can I just interrupt? That's not the motion that's actually been handed out tonight. Look at the motion, because there is a couple of dis legal distinctions. Oh, so, has as a point of clarification, Bob, has Town Council reviewed this motion so that it is in more in Okay. He supplied. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, I'll so read this one. So. Um, <laughs> or I don't. I don't. I'm sorry? Not as a motion. No, no. I mean, I, I'm happy to have Mark read, read the motion. Um, well, it sounds like what we're doing is, correct me if I'm wrong, um, we're changing the members of the ad hoc, as you said, to be two members of the school committee, two members yes. of the select board. Yes. Who will act as co-chairs and a member of the board of library trustees. We are also changing the sunset date from to June 1st, 2020. Um, and the mission is 
removes the language around considering the stakeholder, the recommendations from the stakeholder meeting. Is, is it fair to say that you've streamlined this thing so that you can move towards its ultimate goal in a little more productive and simpler way? Is that, is and, that, is that and a fair thing to say? Keep it within the charter, removes Just issues yeah. around yeah. residents yeah. versus non-residents. Got it. So and we name them. We name, and we name them so that's yeah. clear. Right, so I would I think I, what I was reading was was in the, well, it was, it was, it is from the packet. The, yes. from okay. The packet. So, but, um, Mark, then, I, I mean, I'm given that I want to be sensitive to time because sorry, look, we still have a couple yes, other items. Um, Mark, can you read this full motion for the restructure? Um, we'll take it, yeah, just taking us in its entirety. Okay. Move to dissolve the Ad Hoc Human Rights Committee, repeal section 2.4.1 of the Select Board's policies, and create an ad hoc committee to help establish a human rights focused organization as follows. An ad hoc committee is hereby created to help establish a human rights focused organization. The following representatives shall be invited to participate in members as members in this ad hoc committee. Two members of the school committee, two members of the select board who shall act as co-chairs and a member of the board of library trustees. This ad hoc committee has a sunset date of June 1, 2020. And furthermore, to approve the following members. Um, yeah, our committee members. Ann Landry co-chair, Andrew Friedman co-chair, Linda Snow-Doxer, Elaine Webb, Andrew Grimes. Thank you, Mark. As a point of clarification, as this is an, uh, including a change to our policies, are we required to have a public hearing? So the answer is no. Uh, there's nothing in the charter, nothing in the bylaws, and nothing in your policies that says that you can only amend your policies after a public hearing. It is your usual practice to do so, but the particular provision that you're, that you're removing is the provision that set up the other ad hoc committee. So it, um, yeah, it, it feels like it needs to happen. Yes. Okay. And so the just noted just wanted yes. a point of clarification, wanted, wanted town council blessing. I need a second. All right, and I need a second. I'll, I'll, I'll second that. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? Lovely. Thank you. All right. Next up. Can I go? Um, all right. So next up, we have um, on the agenda so the review of Gas Lake online petition request. Um, the background here is that um, some residents have reached out to Andy and myself. Um, to add this as an article to the warrant for a November town meeting. Um, there's been some general discussions. I will hand it off to Andy to introduce it a little bit more thoroughly, and then we have a member of the public who will be speaking. Of. Right. All I have to say is to take off what Vanessa said. Um, while she was away, I got together with a, a, a number of town residents at my house, including five, five town meeting members, and we drafted the article that will be presented uh, before you, whether that article is folded into uh, the general budget we can discuss later. But this is, this will give you some background into the problem, Dave. All right, so David Zeke, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Um, and just as a point of clarification, it is now 11 o'clock, so um, we're going to try and keep this one brief. There are two things I want you to get out of this okay. conversation because I'm the the Warren article it provides funding to do a, this uh, independent gas leaks audit in Reading, which has been in a number been done in a number of communities, and and the the first point that I, that I want to make is that. Um, we, that we really do still have a gas leaks problem in Reading. Um, you know, that our gas leaks are up 34% just over the last year. That half of the new gas leaks in Reading are, are uh, uh, the grade one leaks, which are the dangerous leaks that have to be fixed immediately. And this situation, we've been tracking this since uh, 2015 in this, in this venue. Yes. John's been here for all of this. And, and, um, and it has not gotten better. And this has gotten the attention of, of uh, citizens in Reading. And that's, and that's um, 
caused them to uh, come up with a petition um, in the packet. Uh, it says 177 Reading signatures. It's now 188 Reading signatures. I'm not going to go through all the terrible things that, that natural gas does, um, but it's everything from from the, the, the climate to, to wasting money and, and, and multiple forms of danger. It, what happened in the Merrimack Valley could have happened here, could still happen here tomorrow. There's nothing special about our setup. Our setup is very much like what what it is and, and, and was in the Merrimack Valley, except they got their pipes replaced now, right? And, and we're working on that. But it, it was the pipe replacement that caused the problem. So that, you know, that was what <coughs> triggered the problem. So anyway, so that so we've got this uh, citizen petition here. That's this. Uh, there's this online position here. It is the uh, and you can look it up and you can see that there's now 188 signatures of, of writing residents for this uh, to to a, do an audit to further address these gas leaks. And that's that's one issue uh, because. Um, Thank you, know, thank you, Andy, and, and thank you, Vanessa, for for um, you know being willing to sponsor this. Um, but this was initiated as a, as a citizen grassroots activity, and that's one point that I want you to you to get. I don't know if you can see how well you can see this. Not well. Um, we've got lower up a little bit. Can I? Oh, yeah. Maybe I can go to full screen or something. Here. No, just up with the percentage there. See the percentage. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit higher on to the right. right. There you yeah. go. Just pump it up. That's it. A little bit. I don't know. There is a full screen here thing here, right? Somewhere. I think they're in. To go to view. Page of display, full screen mode. Okay. We've got three examples of towns that have done this. One of them is Weston. And the second point I want to make is that this is a this is a phased effort. That this that there are, this this goes in a, in a couple of a couple of phases. What you're looking at in this map is a is a a picture of a methane survey, if you will, a street survey where a spectrometer is put into a vehicle, the vehicle drives up and down the streets, so you can see you can see the vehicle driving up the, down the streets. That's 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 the red lines. And whenever it detects methane it, it you get a spike. Now you get a spike either because there is a leak there or um, it, I mean, the size of the spike is due either to the is, is due primarily to the amount and the closeness of the leak. So you could have a leak on private property that doesn't register on the street, but you you'll get a, you get a shorter spike, you know. Or you could come you could drive right over the top of a leak, like over a manhole cover or something like that. You'll get a big burst. So this the the height of these is. Is, is indicative of something, but this does not tell you that there is a leak at that point. It's just it's just information. The first phase is is a, is this driving around, just driving up and down the streets with a with a spectrometer that, that measures methane and, and and getting this kind of a map that tells you where the methane is in town. This this effort costs something under five thousand dollars. Everybody does this first. This is what we would do first. And where you go from here depends on what you, what you glean from this exercise and, and, and then where, what's important to the town. So part of all, the $35,000 that's in the article would pay for quite a bit of analysis and further steps and so forth. This, we, what, what we would actually do is, some, is something that I think we would decide after, after we did this step. That's the phase two. In case of Weston, the phase two was a full assessment of their detected gas leaks. They did. They went through and then came up with their own list of gas leaks, much as the much as the gas company would do. Their result was that they found 292 gas leaks. Uh, you know, 66 percent more than National Grid said. Um, a couple of grade ones, 163 grade twos. 127 grade threes, 102 leaks greater than 2,000 square feet. So, 2,000 square feet is the is the DPU definition of a large volume leak. There's, there are nominally 10 percent of our leaks are large volume leaks, as you can see in Weston. 102 out of 292 is not 10 percent. They found a very large large number of very large leaks in in uh, in Weston. 
that's what they did, and they spent uh, upwards of thirty thousand dollars on on this exercise. Salem, um, this is a different picture. That Salem has a really interesting discussion of what they did with statistics. Again, same thing. They went around and they did the survey. Seventy-nine thousand data points is in the survey. So that's that's what you're starting with. Um, they and and then they they looked at it in different ways. So what you with these bubbles, what you're looking at, you see. The larger the bubble, the more points are included in the, the collected together. Uh, the, the higher the, uh, excuse me, the darker the color, the, the, the higher the methane uh, concentration. This, this was, a, so they went through this whole exercise and this is a picture of, they, they did a daily mapping and calibration because the, meth, the ambient methane in, depends on the weather. It depends on the wind, depends on the humidity. And, and, and uh, so every day, you kind of have to re reset yourself, and that's what they did. And their their website goes through all this. This is just showing leaks in in Salem above the 95th percentile. So so they had uh, what 232 unique sites, but these were the ones that were above the 95th percentile. So th what they what they did then was. Uh, they were they were mostly interested in in their trees, so they hired uh, this. The, the, you know, their next step was to spend uh, four thousand dollars to have a bunch of tree planting sites surveyed. They were planning to plant two hundred twenty new trees. They asked them to go survey each of the locations where they where they were going to plant. We found that twenty six of them were were you know contaminated were, were gas leaks. Uh, so they did not plant the trees in those locations until they, uh, you know, fixed the leaks, and they and, and they, they figured they saved twenty-two thousand dollars because of that. So they they're saving trees. Um, Wellesley, this is this is kind of a blow up of of a part of a part of Wellesley, and um, so Wellesley did this too. Now here you can see. The, uh, the little dots, all the little dots are, are the data points of this vehicle driving around during the survey that I talked to. The diamonds are the, I mean, excuse me, triangles are the, are the uh, gas leak locations as reported by National Grid. Some overlap, some not so much. All of the, all of the green uh, dots are the lowest level here, but at two parts per million, that is more than what is supposed to be the, the, the assumed ambient for methane. So it's leaking everywhere. Wellesley, Wellesley is kind of a mess, actually. But, they, but they, uh, they've got leaks everywhere, but some are worse than others, right? So, so that's what they were trying to do. Now, their, their plan is to take this data, and, and their DPW is, is using this in their discussion with National Grid about road repairs. So how they're going to do it. So they have more information than the triangles about where you know where there is a gas to be to, uh, to be worked on um, before they start paving roads and, and closing them up. So this is another approach. So that's kind of it. I mean, so we. I think that the way, the way this would, would play out is we would do the survey, we would see what the results of the survey were, and we would we would just decide what we wanted to do from there. Um, there would the the money and the art from the, the article provides would would provide for those next steps. I think this is the kind of thing where we would want to have a group of, of stakeholders in the town. You know, DPW, yes, fire department, perhaps. You know, our tree, or, you know, our tree warden. I mean, everybody who has a has a stake in in what's happening with the gas leaks should be involved in deciding what we would want to do further. Um, Is so that how it's been handled by other towns? Do we know? No, not necessarily. I mean, they, they could they could do it. I mean, uh, the Weston, I believe, went for the for the gas leaks analysis from the beginning. Okay. It was pushed by uh, a, a sustainability group in Weston. Okay. Um, so uh, all this says is these are different ways that we could that we could uh, use the information. So does that indicate at the very bottom of that page um, that our DPW then <laughs> steps into the role of repair and maintenance? No, not at all. It just means that they know where the gas leaks are. So when they talk to National Grid about when they coordinate repairs with roads, road uh, work, that they have better information than what National Grid is provided. And is the idea here to position us that if National Grid doesn't act on our on our work to sue them for cause? Because I, you no. know they know where the leaks are. No, 
They, they, they Well, they, they know there's a lot of leaks that they, you know, you, we, as you pointed out, we've been talking about this yeah. together here yeah. for several years. Right. And there was many, many leaks. And, uh, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't sound like progress is being made. No, it's absolutely not being made. I mean, they're not doing anything. But that's, that was the point of this, this picture in Wellesley. The, the, the national grid leaks are the triangles. Yep. And, the, and then all the dots on all the roads are showing you where there's, where there's methane coming out. They're, they're not, they, are not report, they are reporting leaks that have been called in by somebody. You know, if you call 911 or you call national grid, it'll go into their database. They are not, you know. I get, I get that they're yeah. not reporting themselves. Yeah. And they're not kidding. Well, they do a survey themselves, too. But, but they are not, but they're coming up with answers that are 50% of yeah. what's actually out there. So by doing this, and I'm not opposed to this in no, any way. No, I, no, I actually no, think it's a great idea. Um, what does it get us? I mean, I'm, mm -hmm. what's the end game, I guess, is what I'm looking for. Because National Grid has demonstrated now over many years mm -hmm. an unwillingness to fix their broken stuff. Mm -hmm. Right? Well, or wrong? Well, let's, let's run with our nation. So, so there. <laughs> So, so, it's, so there, this, this, I don't, this could get to be a long answer. I, let me try. We are pushing the DPU to up the, okay. the, the regulations. Right. So the, addressing the large leaks, um, you know, address and, and uh, is part of that. You know, part, the latest regulation requires all of the utilities to fix every grade three leak that existed in January 2018 within eight years. I don't think that's going to happen. But but they but in order for them to do what you just said, just blow it off, they're going to have to they're going to get right into it with with the regulatory agency. So we're fortifying a position we took four or five years ago. Yes, yes. This is what we're trying. And we didn't have any leverage there to Got speak it. of. But yeah. we but one of the things that we did, and when this and when Reading uh, endorsed you know a couple of gas yeah. leaks uh, bills, um, that was that. The, not just Reading, but the, all the towns that did that got the attention in the legislature, and, they, and that caused them to pass a couple of really yeah. good laws that address the larger. And this leaks. just amps that up. That much it does. It's okay. a, so it's you know information. Just, to, just really information is power. The end game here. here. So. And and I do not. And and while I believe there are the, the, the people who did the uh, petition would probably tell you that they what they have in mind is doing our own uh, gas leaks map. Um, I would say let's. Let's let's do the fair first phase and then see if that's a way, if that's yeah. where we want to end up. And this could uh, this could this could uh, David um, this could also find grade one leaks that that are are uh, a safety hazard and that they would have to fix right away. The, the, well, we, yeah. I mean, if it, sort of. typically what happens when they do this survey, if they run across a grade one leak, they stop the car and call it in. Yeah. I mean, it's um, like you know. Thank you, Dave, for that. Yeah. Um, Bob, do you have thoughts on? I was just reading the article. Um, I think the article is pretty straightforward um, and can be done in the time period that you need. Um, obviously, the presentation at town meeting is complex, but I, I think that maybe to John's point is what do we do at different stages and who gets to decide is pretty important. Ray, correct me. I don't think that has to be in the language. No, this is just uh, this is just kind of this is just appropriate money. Right, right. Uh, it doesn't I mean they, someone might ask you? Somebody's right. going to ask you that they question. Will. Uh, but the, but the, in terms of them clo the board closing the warrant in a couple of weeks, that's not it's more or less right. exact. Yeah. What so you, there's what I, you mean. there's two items then that then that I'd like to discuss. One, I mean, this was brought to Andy and myself as a separate article. Um, to be included in town warrant. However, the amount, which my understanding is thirty-five thousand, up to, mm -hmm. up to, yeah, okay, mm -hmm. up to um, may not necessarily, no pun intended, warrant its own article um, when it can be incorporated into Article Four. Correct. Um, so, I appreciate that this was brought forward to us. I think it's a worthwhile endeavor. From a practical perspective, I would fold it into Article Four. Mark, uh, there are, I don't know where you would weigh in, um, or Ann, I think, and I would be curious, Bob, from where you sit, because let's face facts, you're the one that would be essentially asked with collaborating with or implementing whatever measures are necessary. 
but, uh, but there would be staff. an expert in here that we would hire yes. that would help oh. us oh, that um, long, so we're oh, not oh, just. I hope so. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. Who's the we? So is the we going to be director of I think DPW? That, I think that needs to be described at town meeting. Sorry. Well, and this but. is where I want to make sure we're clear on who owns this. We right. can appropriate the funds and or ask for the funds to be appropriated, right. but that. Bob, you, or Jane, uh, or whoever would be tasked, are would be on board with this yeah. project or effort. Yeah, the the, um, the advantage of having this as a standalone is everyone can understand exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. um, I was concerned early on in this that there'd be some risk in funding it if free cash wasn't available. Um, Sharon assures me that I shouldn't worry, but I can't help it. Um, if it isn't available, the very last round of defenses you use a stabilization fund, but that requires a two-thirds vote instead of just a majority, just to be clear. I think there's other ways to fund it. Um, if it's rolled into Article 4, it doesn't draw as much attention to itself, either in a positive or a negative way. Um, but normally our Article 4 votes do not go into this kind of detail for each item. It's just mm -hmm. fund these things, and they're very easily described. I think it would be a great error not to put a light on it. I, I think don't see any reason why this language couldn't be rolled yeah. into the motion of Article 4, but it's not traditional. Okay. I'm fine either way. It seemed to... But we're talking about $3 million. If you differ, yeah. we're talking about 35000 yeah, I'm fine. Well, I don't think it's the issue of the amount of money. I think it's the issue of what's the activity and the importance of doing it. Okay. So I wouldn't have a problem if it's in Article 4, but this is a specific line item in Article 4. Or have it be its own article. I think if we're going to include this type of language, it needs to be its own article. Otherwise, it's going to slow down the process yeah. for Article 4. <laughs> and it opens up, uh, it lets people know a what's going on the reality of what's going on and B that we're taking a stand to do something about it you know because it's local this is local yeah you I know, see advantages to both yeah, that, that said right what it, once we own this information as a town have we opened ourselves up to some kind of liability because we've we've commissioned a study that identified problems and now we know that there are level one problems well um, so, uh, no, I would say the, the general answer is no. Um, the, um, if we identify grade one leaks, um, I suppose, and then we did nothing with that information, that might be a problem, but even then, it, um, uh, even then, it, it's not our pipes that are leaking. Um, so I, I don't think that that's a problem. There, um, uh, um, you know, I think there, you know, there's potential for lots of of, of um, pushback. With you know, it's not like you're going to take this information and hand it to National Grid and they're going to say, "Thank you very much. We had no idea." Yeah, we'll be and, here tomorrow. And, <laughs> so we'll take care of all of these right away. That's not really probably what's likely to happen. Right. So, uh, you know, right out of the box, they're probably um, you, you can probably expect that National Grid will have issues with the methodology that we used and the and you know the equipment that we used and whatever so we need to be thinking about uh, uh, when when we're hiring somebody that we make sure that we we've, we've got you know a credible expert who's using accepted technology so that if we have to go to the DPU and say this leak that they're saying is grade 3 where we think it's really grade 1 that the DPU is going to listen to that um, I don't want to, uh, if, if we can avoid it, I, I think we don't want to get into the business that we're directly ordering National Grid to do something because they'll immediately go to the DPO and try to you know, overturn what we do and we'll get into a big legal battle or whatever. So to the extent that we can, we, we can use credibility as opposed to legal force to, to induce National Grid to do the right thing. Um, that's what I'm, that's what I would like to start. Um, I mean, anybody who takes a look at you know what's going on in my office knows that we spend more time battling um, um, natural gas companies than pretty much anybody else. So, um, yeah. um, 
uh, you know, if we have to, we'll do it. But that's not where you want to start. You want to start by having credible information that you present and hopefully you encourage National Grid to do the right thing about it. And the idea of, of having a program that's tied to road repairs that are happening anyway, that if you're going to dig up the road, now's the time to deal with, uh, right. deal with this, you know, that, that's a sensible approach. So from the Next Steps perspective, Andy and I have been asked to sponsor this. We've agreed. Right. Um, I think there's agreement along, along the board that this should be its own article. Um, Ray, have you reviewed this language for potential inclusion in the world? No, but no? I'm happy to. Okay. And so as far as next steps then, um, Bob, can you please send this to Ray for his review and when we vote on the town warrant, not on the not September 9th, yes? 10th. 10th. 10th? Yeah. Um, on September 10th, then we will have this included as part of the warrant. I would like to see um, someone have responsibility um, in town staff for implementing as part of the article. Because right now it's the town will, and it's not clear to me what that means. I would get money. Can the town will, appropriate, will vote to raise funds and appropriate. Um, yeah, the idea, I think, is to have the, the expert then work with uh, Town deep, staff. Deep, deep town staff, yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't want to get too specific on that. Bob, feel free to jump in here. Yeah, I'm, I mean, certainly debt authorization is under the direction of the town manager because it's an amount for procurement law that mm -hmm. has to be made. Yeah. Uh, this one, you can sort of do what you want. I, I do think you want to be a little careful that you decide something up front that doesn't work out down the road. Mm -hmm. So I can work with Ray on trying to make this more specific if it's sensible and then maybe give you some options on the time. Mm -hmm. Take that approach. If you're comfortable without the specific, I'll, I'll back away. Yeah. yeah, I'm not really sure operationally how this will work. I understand, too. I understand <laughs> you know, DPW already does this with National Grid on leaks they agree that they know about. I don't think this is really changing anything other than it's changing what National Grid knows about. Right, which is well, and it gives us, knows about it. it gives us information when talking and negotiating with National Grid. Right. Now, if, I don't want to belabor this, but if it gets into the operations of DPW and how they do work, that's different. Mm -hmm. No, I wouldn't want to go down like, that Don't path. pave that road because there's a gas leak they won't repair. Don't plant a tree there. I mean, we might not do that anyways, but that's, that's why the article uh, itself, I think, is pretty straightforward. It's yeah. what do we do that's a little more complicated. Yeah. I feel like once it gets down into the nitty-gritty of how it is implemented in that sense I would be inclined to give that authority over to the town staff I mean they're the ones that are familiar with the roads and yeah but I, I think to David's point um, who gets to decide you get an initial chunk of information who gets to decide what to do next is pretty important not for the I don't think for the language but just for the yeah. town meeting presentation yeah. I mean I think I'd be interested the way I would see it unfolding is we conduct the first assessment, we see what the report is, you and DPW staff and the engineers take a look at it, and then you, could come back to the you can make a presentation to us, but I would imagine that based on what comes back, it would provide you, you would be, you and the staff would be much more, would be in a better position to determine what to do with it from there. We could certainly opine, but... Yeah, I'll think about that. I mean, we could have it as, as, you know, we could put it forward for a presentation in the future yeah. and presumably present a town meeting on the status, but right. I don't want to get into the habit of us telling engineering what to do. No, That's but I, I, I think there's, an, there's a couple of advantages to this that, that haven't been stressed. One is that it provides not just us and town staff with information uh, in communicating and working with National Grid, but it also provides residents of knowledge of where there are gas leaks in town, including on town properties such as school properties. Um, and yeah, I think that's that's a benefit to the town, the townspeople. 
so they're aware of it. I mean, this natural gas, we've always thought of as the clean energy. It's it's not I'm gonna, clean I'm going to cut you off, yep. Andy. Yep. All right. Uh, my only area of concern is when you get onto private property, which this does, um, I don't think it's appropriate the town staff get in the middle of that. They really don't have a role. It's the, it's the private homeowner and national grid. Well, this sounds, I mean, they're on the road, so they're on the That's different. Yeah, it's different. This, yeah. this, this, but this, and, and part of that is, is there's a word extent, and then in the next sentence the word extends, and I, I'm a little unclear as to, uh, as to, so, so a natural gas leak usually occurs in a specific spot in a, in a pipe. But so we're gonna. And when you talk about extends, I think he, that they're referring to, to the geographic area where, where, the leak has 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 dissipated, has dissipated to, yeah. and um, and um, so that's not. So a leak could be on private property and extend onto the public pro onto public property, or the other way, the leak could be. So we will property. leave the language in your capable hands, <laughs> and we look forward to that at our next meeting. Thank you. I'm so glad. <laughs> All right. If there are, there's no vote here. So how do we put it on the warrant? Is that what we're It'll come next time. Yes. Yes. It'll be included on the warrant. But, but Andy and I as sponsors. We, but uh, we'll assume it. We'll assume it is a separate article. Yeah. Yes, okay. please. Right. Wonderful. And we'll fool with the language. And if I, oh. if Ray, we could. Uh, have some discussions about that so if I could answer any questions as to where the so the grassroots group was trying to go with this. Why don't, why don't we take that offline? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to close this item. Let's, given that it is 11.30 and we still have to go into executive session, uh, I'm going to suggest we table future agendas and minutes approval. Yes. Everyone's amenable for that? Yes. Great. Um, so do we have a motion, Mark, to adjourn to executive session? Move to enter into executive session under purpose three to discuss strategy with respect to DeRezzo versus Town of Reading at all. As the chair has declared that an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of the public body to invite town council into the executive session and not to return Thank to the session. Thank you, David. Thanks, David. Thank you, David. Sorry. And not to return to open session. Roll call vote required. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, roll call. Andy. Yes. Mark. Yes. Vanessa. Yes. John. Yes. And? Yes. Great. Uh, motion carries. We are adjourned.